Uh, kia ora koutou. Nā mei nui kia koutou i huuhui mai nei. Um, welcome to this, um, the Otago Regional Council Environment, Science and Policy Committee meeting um, being held in Wanaka. We'll just um, start the proceedings with a karakia. Tuaiki rongo, tuaiki raro, tuaiki waho, tuaiki roto, tuaiki te haere tangata. Karongo te pō, karongo te ao, homi ei, hui ei, teiki ei. Um, so once again, I'd just like to welcome everybody here today. We've got a good turnout um, in, in the room and we've got a really awesome um, turnout of um, local people here that are coming to um, both present and just to observe today. So it's really awesome to have you guys here. Online we've got um, um, uh, Matoa Edward Allison, uh, my co-chair for this committee. So uh, no my hori my Edward. Um, and also online we have, I believe we've got, oh, we've got Kevin there. Well done, Kevin. It's good to see you. And we're expecting um, Elliot, a councillor where and councillor laws that may pop online when they become available. So thank you all very much for your attendance today. Um, away we go. Oh, before I start, I've got to do, I've written it down here, safety briefing. So between um, Kylie and myself, we'll get that sorted. So in the event of an emergency, anything that shakes or is hot, we will exit out through the same way that we came in, out into the um, grassy area out the front there. Um, the uh, Wharipaku uh, bathrooms are just out the door on the uh, right. Um, there's a defibrillator in the, in the hallway of um, people's hearts start to race too much. And the other one is, and I'm not actually sure how to get there, but upstairs there's a kitchen that um, if you need to get yourself a quick cup of coffee or, or, or cold water. So we'll just, so um, thank you for that. Um, it's a true privilege to be here in this, in, in amongst these stunning landscapes in the town of Wanaka, um, in the midst of our southern lakes, Rohi. Connecting with our, with our communities is a priority of this council and we have made it a commitment to be more visible across all of Otago. So thank you all very much for hosting us here in Wanaka, in your town. Um, and to complement that today, we've got um, six speakers that are going to speak on local topics, per, uh, topics pertinent to the local area. And we, we, we're really feeling privileged to, to um, have you guys come along and present to us. So just before we start, um, we'll do our oh, apologies. Sorry, I forgot to do apologies, Kylie. We have an apology. We have an apology from um, Karen Coates who is um, uh, our second EWI representative on the Environment um, Policy Committee. So someone would like to move to accept the apologies. Thanks, Kate. Thank you, Thanks, Andrew. All those in favour, say aye. 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 Sorry? Oh, Council, okay. So I'll we'll add those in, sorry. Councillor Laws. Councillor Elliott. Thanks, then, Andrew. That's full of the lateness if they don't get online. Okay, thank you. So we just um, pretty much start the meeting. We move straight to public forum, but before we do that, we just have to create... Um, we've got um, six speakers today and sort of some pretty in-depth subjects going through, so we'd just like to someone to move a motion to extend the time period for speaking in public forum from five minutes to 15 metres minutes per speaker. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Alexa. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Thank you. So we'll kick it off. So it's my, very much my pleasure to welcome today uh, Ma uh, Dr Mandy Bell and accompanied by Prue um, along today to um, representing Why Wanaka. Um, Why Wanaka's vision is working together for healthy water, which seems pretty awesome. And as you all know, Why Wanaka has been very prominent in the... Um, and not just central Otago area, but the whole of Otago area with their environmental initiatives, particularly around deep water lakes, which is really awesome. So I'll pretty much just leave it in your hands, um, Mandy, and um, we'll do our 15 minutes and then we can have questions afterwards. Okay? Thank you. Uh, we had a fantastic day um, last Monday. 
So, um, I'm Mindy Bell. I'm a, a mother, mother, a wife, a farmer, a passionate um, supporter and carer of our amazing lakes and our rivers and our environment up here. And I've been privileged to be part of Waiwanaka since 2016 and, and an amazing team that have really been doing a lot of work in all, all um, spaces since we started. I've got um, some slides here today and um, I really, there are a few, but I want them to be almost like a hook or a touch point for, um, to illustrate some of the work that we're doing and if there's things that pique your interest or there are connections that can be made with work that might be happening, gaps or whatever, um, please um, get back in touch with us and we can um, take that further. Accelerating action um, for our fresh water, that's what Waiwanaka is all about. Um, and we started uh, discussions on how we could collaborate. Collaboration is a really core part of Waiwanaka. We, we have a, a term whole of basin, whole of community. We are um, rural, we are urban, and we have a, a lot of visitors that come to our town. Pre-COVID, we were 1.4 million visitors. And in 2016, when we looked forward and looked at the number of consents that were um, in play, looking forward 10 years, our town was going to double in size. Hard to believe, but that's absolutely what has happened. So a group of us sat around the table, the Guardians, um, Upper Clutha Lakes Group, as we call, water group as we called ourselves back then, tourists, fishermen, um, mana whenua, and a broad section, including councils, sat down and we said, what do we really care about? Where do we want to be in 50 years? Where are we today? Back casting and then looking forward and creating a work plan. Part of that was understanding what is the catchment that we want to um, be working within, 4,600 square kilometres. And if you imagine yourself standing on top of the, the Red Bridge at Luggett, you've got the Luggett Creek comes in just behind to the Mata'au, and then the whole basin that's laid out in front of you. So when we're talking about the work we do, that is, that is the space. Education and community is central to the work that we do. We really um, see through social science, but also as a community, if we work together and we understand um, our water, our environment, and people understand their impact on it, then that is the start of change and wanting to be part of what we need to do. We have had, uh, about two, three months ago, we had a, a deep process on looking at our, who we were and what we do and what we don't do, because it was quite broad. And refining what we do. We are interested in, in um, are research based for all of the actions and, and how we go forwards. We build knowledge about the state of our lakes and, and what we found out last week is that we have got a lot of gaps, but that's part of understanding um, where we are and where we need to be, what we need to know to actually look after this place. Advocacy, we are um, what we call mature advocates. We're not act um, activists. We sit around the table working with people in a constructive way. How can we work better together, understanding where we want to be and where we are now to go forwards? And a bit, big part of this is community action, raising awareness, education, and then actually getting out and doing stuff. When we first um, started, and um, huge thanks, and it's, it's good to remind where we've come, ourselves where we've come from, Regional Council was pivotal in our first, securing our first fund with Ministry for the Environment, the Freshwater Improvement Fund. One of the core pieces of work we did from, from that, um, with that support and that um, funding, was to create a community catchment plan for the whole, whole of our catchment. At the same time that we were working through um, from a bottoms up, um, process here with the community, I was sitting on the Freshwater Leaders Group in Wellington and part of creation of, of policy. And what was fascinating was as the community was working through what's important for us... Recording in progress. Here we go. Um, so proactive was really important. And where we landed as a community was with 60 actions that, as we pulled them together, healthy ecosystems and community wellbeing. In Wellington, the same focus was coming. So it was fascinating from, from both angles that this is where we landed. We understand the pressures on the left there. We um, understood what the problems were and what were the, um, how do we revitalise Te Tau? How do we go forwards? 
We needed programs, we needed the discipline, the systems and the structure to do that, which sits there under process. So this is sort of it's a very good stead and still does seven years later that piece of work. Um, I'm just going to um, flip through four slides that describe our action groups. We have a, a number of action groups, and this is people working together using social science that is well established in the primary sector over the last 10 years, how we can work together to be more effective. So we have in our catchment, um, Dockland catchment groups, um, including um, five that we work closely with, as well as um, we work closely with Lake Wanaka, who are presenting um, later on this, this afternoon. And then there's no point in having larger catchment groups, particularly with weeds and pests, which, without understanding that your neighbours might be smaller, and we also need to be working together. So we have smaller landowner groups and then um, urban action groups, really excited about what's happening in um, in town, I talk, I talk about country coming to town with a lot of the learnings we've gained over the last 10 years. Let's move into town and, and, um, and take some of those, a lot of that thinking and that doing. Revitalised to tile. Um, we have been fortunate, um, following on from our community catchment plan funded under the Ministry for the Environment, which then, um, March 2020, we were fortunate to start dialogue on being a um, recipient of Jobs for Nature funding. So we took the, that community catchment plan along with um, a number of other initiatives that were happening around NZ and that created our Jobs for Nature programme. Out of that, a lot more questions um, were sitting on the table and we were fortunate to be supported by our land and water in a programme um, revitalising to tile. It is a whole approach very much aligned to how we think at Waiwanaka and what our community had said very strongly through, to us through the community um, catchment planning. So this is a place-based research um, and it developing evidence-based examples how agribusiness and communities can make enduring changes in land use and management alongside having value chains and a market focus. There are three um, pilots from Agri-C up in the Waikato to Taranaki and down here at, um, in Wanaka. Where we started at the start of this particular programme, which I'm just going to delve a bit deeper into now, where we started and, and we have advisors and experts from, um, from universities and um, expertise from around New Zealand working with us in this programme, is they said to us, you actually have a prototype in action here already in this community. And it's not just Waiwanaka, it's, it's Te Kākono, it's Wao, and these other really, um, I think, forward-thinking groups, and we're collaborating and working together to catalyse a whole community towards revitalising to tile. And that's underpinned by the passion that people have when we come to live here to actually be proactive and not um, doing catch-up to look after our lakes and to understand what we need to do where we are. So we have a, a large network of trusted relationships as part of this programme. Um, Ag Research um, links in as, as management of the programme funded by our land and water. We've developed a number of tools, but we don't develop tools without understanding do they exist already. We don't need to um, um, circle back round and do things twice. We have a, a fantastic team of 12 at Waiwanaka that are working on this program. It's a really tight one, which is hard work. It's a year and a half, um, but with a lot of support, we've got some tremendous work happening that is layering on top of um, where we started. This is a, a snapshot of this program. Local landowners, community, tangata whenua, experts weaving knowledge and that's the key thing is that we are actually looking to work together. Um, mana whenua and, it's, and it's, um, a, a, we're working to establish a long-term respectful relationship with mana whenua, understanding that um, this takes time and it is so critical for, for us as, and all of us as we go forwards. There are two po, um, understanding the history of the land um, from tangata whenua and tangata tuati point of view. And over on the right, I've talked to, I mentioned that, it's the interweaving of what we know from the past, where we are today, but taking on board climate change and changes going forwards, going beyond those traditional farm plans um, to enhance the vitality of tatao. 
and in the centre there, those are the core things um, for us, collaboration, sharing of knowledge, vision into action, whole approach and connection to place. Just now I'm just going to take a snapshot of um, some key projects, so I, I will be flicking through, but um, the, this information's um, there for you to come back to us afterwards. So Upper Clutha Biodiversity Strategy, this has been um, a community-led project um, with experts led by David Norton, and we have um, completed the strategy and are going back out to community um, to, to launch this and also um, talking with um, Queenstown over the hill on, on expanding that across their biodiversity monitoring. Um, this is fantastic. We've been doing this for three years, started under the Jobs for Nature program, freshwater monitoring and biodiversity. Um, and we measure um, visual soils, vegetative poto points, bird monitoring and more. And the farmers are working with us and learning how to do this, but there is an opportunity um, going forwards and, um, and talking with other catchment groups around New Zealand that um, this is something that catchment groups could be doing to make it easier for farmers to be um, doing this, this core monitoring work. Integrated management software over the last three, four years with Jobs for Nature and going forwards we have um, software where we, uh, that is time-based and geolocates every piece of work that we have done, whether it's um, rabbit control, weed control, that monitoring that we've been talking about, planting of trees, every um, plant or tree that has been um, put in the ground in the last three years is located on this, on this detailed map and we can hit buttons and, and look at property owners or um, go backwards and forwards with that information. What we are looking to do is to take the, um, this a step further, and it already is in process. Um, you can see down the bottom of this, um, this the blue is we, what we are looking to do is to mesh network the whole valley. And if we look down the bottom, there's a whole lot of white. That's because there are so many um, I 80 to 20 traps with really smart technology sitting in them. They've got AI sitting in there, um, infrared, um, cameras, sound, um, and they are trapping 48 of them at the moment. This was the precursor to what um, Southern Lake Century are doing some amazing work over the hill and also down at Halo. So the traps were out at the Luggett and the, um, and the Alisburn, and there's a relay station, so out there we are mesh networked. Now there's the opportunity to take this further across the valley so that other traps can connect in without having to put in relay stations and also start pulling in all the other remote sensing that is smart. Water quality, um, cacophony, bird sounds, so all of these things that will tell us we're, we're, we're making progress can be um, monitored, but they're coming into a single pane of glass. So that's pretty exciting, and, and um, making progress on that. All of this then comes in to, in another piece of work, to support um, programs, a farm assurance program, this one is called PLUS, and this is gathering momentum around the country. Originally it was set up for a market-led program, but increasingly we're seeing this in the primary sector, that it's invaluable for farmers to, to I talk about dropping of the shoulders and the overwhelm from all of the different policies. We have a black bucket that, um, I, call it, I call it a black bucket, where all of these policies require farmers to do something, and NZ Fat Plus actually puts this in one place. Um, includes people, natural resources and biosecurity. What is also exciting is that MFE has been working with the people that have developed this programme to, um, to bring in the blue module or freshwater farm plan, so it's going to be in one space. Jumping across from land use and land management, value, value chain and land use diversification and market opportunities programme. Um, Prue's leading this one with um, some experts, um, Ellen McDermott. Looking at, these are all the things that could be grown in this valley. These are our soils and our natural resources. If we take a multi-criteria decision approach with farmers, 12 to 16 farmers in this project, and look at what we could be doing, and then we'll be pulling some of those potential land use, um, but it's broader than just, just land. Energy, for example, is, is one of the potential projects 
pulling them through into a deep dive business case um, by the end of February to, for us as landowners to, to broaden what we could be doing in the diversification space. I've mentioned this briefly, urban catchments project, country coming to town with some smarts, and we've got um, on the, the right here is one of the first groups that's um, been working with Queenstown Lakes District to, and to Kākano to carrying out controls, but what we're particularly interested in is once you get people working together, um, then let's focus on stormwater drains and we actually start to create awareness and behaviour change through people working together. We have um, 20 drains around um, Lake Wanaka and we've mapped out the whole of um, the region based on drains, treating a drain as a creek um, running into the lake. Education runs all the way through this. We need education and awareness to create behaviour change and everything we do has to be integrated, whether it's um, um, out on the farms, our environment is an integrated environment. As soon as we start siloing um, policies or siloing behaviours, we're not going to get the outcome that we could have. So leading on, it's sort of, um, we've started, if we start from here, we've got a whole lot of initiatives and they keep coming up. The critical thing at the end of the day is all of these things that we're doing and that we have funding for actually making a difference. Have we got a positive impact on the environment? So another um, program that PRU is, is leading, but it, it's a community-led one, um, and let's take the data sets that are available and in the future, remote sensing data coming in, to actually um, pull it into one space to have an annual report and for it to be interactive. So we have um, our first prototype is, is completed and we're now working into the next space. So you can see those catchment health indicators. We're working with a group from overseas supported by Lincoln University to actually develop this. Um, but what it tells us as a community, um, yes, you, this is making a difference, or no, um, we need to have a rethink and delve deeper into that particular indicator. And our final one, which was as, as fresh as last um, Monday, we had 40 um, sciences, scientists from around 21 organisations here in, in this place, um, hosted by Regional Council and, um, and Y Wanaka. We are just at the moment um, going through screeds of butcher paper to understand um, some questions and those key themes we can see there that are coming through that are going to inform the research working group and then through to the, um, the regional council governance group. Knowledge creation, we need normal monitoring. Social and behaviour science is critical to put that knowledge into action. Bridging the gap, um, that came through in, in quite a strong way. Who, are, who is going to lead this? Who's going to wake up in the morning and go, what are we doing? What's next? How can we be more connected and collaborative in this space? Understanding um, the stocks and flows of our natural capital, that's a program that we have um, also happening at Waiwanaka. Taking action and um, again collaboration is the key thing there. Um, we don't like silos um, wherever possible. Let's actually um, make sure that we haven't got the gaps and that we're not layering on, on top of each other. So finally, um, there's a lot going on, but we've got a remarkable team, and this is work that has been going on for six, seven years now, that, and each part keeps building on the other. Our key focus for these next 12 months is the, um, the, the Lake Science Research Advisory Group. That is really exciting community, working with science and the Regional Council to, to head in, the, in, in a really strong direction for our environment. We finish up with our Knowledge Into Action Program in um, February next year, so we are looking at where those programs to land, but also, um, and it's always a, you know, a funding word, um, working with people in Wellington, and also looking across New Zealand with the New Zealand catchment community, how can we as catchment groups be better working together and have a core base of funding that enables us to keep the doors open so as, as needs arise, we can layer up or layer down accordingly. The Conservation Alliance, we've been working with Manatahuna and Southern Lake Sanctuary for quite some time over the hill. How can we work better together? And at the end of the day, it's, it's about this, a beautiful environment, healthy ecosystems, 
and a really healthy community um, for future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regional Council. How long over? Oh, sorry. So we will have time just for a couple of quick questions. Thanks, Mandy and Drew. Um, I'm really interested in your monitoring. We've got a new crossover to EPMUs with Lake Dunstan and um, Upper Lakes. We've got, as we've gone out and had before we can um, talk to people, there is um, people concerned about the shortage of data. I'm just wondering, don't be to do it now, but where do we find out which monitoring sites you've got and how long they've been operating for in the data? Do you have that available online or? Um, so that's that um, program, the basic catchment wide monitoring yeah. program I spoke to that will, yeah. will bring that through. Obviously, if it's on landowners, then there's um, data. Um, is there, so it's publicly available. Yep. Yeah. So um, we are working through that. We have actually had um, uh, somebody has come in and taken public water data, mm -hmm. plus project data, plus landowner water data to say, to inform what we should be doing, you know, what does that look like, and then to allow landowners to hone in on where they should be focusing their attentions. And I know um, Chris is here and is, you know, is being part of that as well. So yeah. biodiversity, um, that's a process we're working through. Yep. That, that's awesome. We'll go to, um, uh, was it Brian, was it? Yep. Yeah, Cole, hey, and thank Tim. you for all your work. Um, what's the data that you've collected telling us so far? Am I allowed to ask that? Yep, um, I'd say water. Um, out, out in the, um, the rivers and things, we've actually got good water. Um, the lakes are a concern, but we don't actually have enough data to um, truly understand what is going on there, which is the lake summit. Uh, biodiversity, that's a, a lot of the data is a longer term, and you can't actually take just a snapshot, but in general, our soils are, are, are good, are, are great. Um, bird counts, fascinating because there's a lot of trapping going on, so um, depending where the trapping has happened, we've got a, you know, a wide variety of birds and increasingly birds coming back. Um, one of the other key ones, vegetative photo points, that's been a fascinating one to do with landowners because we go back to the 60s or even earlier, depending on what photos they have, and then take a GPS location so that we can look back from the same place and then look forward. In general, we are seeing increased um, um, native native plants and trees coming back, and a good example up at the um, the Luggett Creek, we've had fenced off for 30 years. Um, David Norton wandering around there with me, I could not believe the regenerating tortora that we've got there. So it's actually quite positive, cool. but the lakes are where we really need to focus. Yeah, more awesome. knowledge, more science. Awesome, thank you. One last question from Tim. Uh, minimum from the Otago catchment and community for the sort of work that we're doing. It's really supportive for new groups and, and small specific projects, but it doesn't go far at all. Um, and uh, we need to, and this is part of, we call it Enduring Why, Wanaka, and so we've been supported um, by MPI to create a community of practice. What does a community of practice look like? How can we be enduring? Because the that question is the same question that's been asked around by every catchment group as they fall off jobs for nature or other funding. And I believe there is a way forward, or we do, and we're working um, with catchment groups across New Zealand, the Conservation Alliance, so there's a number of initiatives that we need to get ourselves into a position where we can keep the good work going because it, it can't fall to a regional council, it can't fall just to a community. We have to figure it out together and um, be determined to actually um, get to that end point, yeah. Are you getting any contribution from DOC or central government? No, so uh, not at, not at the moment. No. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you. Uh, this has been a really really awesome se session. Thank you guys, and thanks right. for coming along. And um, I'm sure we'll be, uh, have many more sessions with you yeah. somewhere. Right.
Thank you, Lloyd. Thank you, everybody. So our, our, our next um, contributor in the public session is um, Tom Kay and Chelsea McGaw from Forest and Bird, and they're, and they're sharing their um, presentation, both Tom and Chelsea, um, Chelsea are online, so uh, making room for the river, so this will be interesting. So um, we'll let you guys take it, take it from here. Kia ora, thank you. Um, can I just make sure that oh, yep, the screen is working? That's great. Um, kia ora everyone, I'm Tom Kay. I'm the freshwater advocate at Forest and Bird, and as mentioned, I'm joined by Chelsea McGaw, who's our regional conservation manager for the area. Um, I've got a lot of info, so I'm just going to rip straight into it, so I stick to the time limit. Um, this is a presentation on making room for rivers. It's something we've been taking to regional councils around Aotearoa. We've been to about nine or ten now, including you. Um, and it's really about We'll come out of this um, this impact of the cyclones in particular. Uh, I work as the freshwater advocate for Forest and Bird in Wellington, that's where I'm based, but I grew up in Hawke's Bay and uh, I followed what was happening with the cyclone really closely even though I wasn't there in the region and, and in particular I was watching one river called the Tutaikuri River um, as it rose through the night of the, the 13th of February and into the morning of the 14th of February and trying to figure out on the council's flow gauge whether that river was still rising or falling through the night. Um, it peaked at about 1,800 cubic metres per second, 1,800 tonnes of water flowing past the point every second, um, possibly not as high as some of the rivers you have, but for that river it was probably the highest flow that's been recorded. And I was looking at that river because um, I wanted to know if it was likely to, to breach the stop banks because uh, my family lives just downstream from that flow gauge about 600 metres from the river. This photo here is actually that river when it took out the bridge a couple of a couple months after the cyclone, um, the aftermath. At about 10 o'clock that river did actually um, overtop its stop banks. This is the river bursting out through Waiheke and into Taradao at the top of the image there. And at about 10 o'clock, everyone in those suburbs was told to evacuate, including my family. This is the street of my sister here on the left. Um, her and my niece and nephew and my brother-in-law, so three and five-year-old, um, they evacuated, went to my parents' place a couple of hundred metres away where it was a little bit drier, um, and they were thankfully okay. Their houses were okay. Um, but of course, you know, wider across the region, there were massive impacts. Um, this is an image of the Tutakuri River there with Taradao uh, at the Yellow Arrow, where the, the river sort of came over or around the stop bank into the, su into the suburb, and then down towards Hastings here. And this is pre-cyclone. You compare that to post-cyclone, um, and you can just see the sediment and the floodwaters that have been everywhere across that landscape. Interestingly, looking at the stop banks that were sort of supposed to protect this part of the region, um, they sort of go roughly like this, I've drawn them on. You can see how Taradao at the top of the image has a stop bank that lines it that had just been lifted and, and strengthened. It sort of mostly protected Taradao, but water still snuck around the top of it when the bridge was backed up against. And all this region between the two stop banks um, actually became enormously problematic. Water broke out of the Ngarudoro River at the bottom there and the Tutakuri and filled this uh, space in blue here, basically turning that into a huge bathtub. Um, it backed up behind the stop bank where it meets near the sea, only eventually draining once it was deep enough to overtop the stop bank and go back into the river. And you may have seen people being rescued off rooftops in that area. That is why um, those stop banks basically created that problem. The flooding from Cyclone Gabriel was some of the most intense we've seen and the most recent of course, but just weeks before that we had flooding in Auckland, months before that we had flooding in Nelson, we've had flooding in Tairawhi to Gisborne regularly, West Coast, Canterbury, um, all sorts of places going back quite some time. And of course just recently flooding down your way south on Otago. After the cyclone, Dr. Sandine from Niwa, their principal climate scientist, said, I have no doubt in my mind that climate change has influenced that event, and the Met Service said these events will become more severe as the planet continues to warm. So we've got climate change driving this, but we've also got um, other factors that have made things worse, like the draining of wetlands, for example. This is a map on the left showing the predicted historic wetland extent across Aotearoa. On the right here, you can see how much we've got left. So all those areas in the landscape that were sponges absorbing water, holding water, um, have been drained, in many cases developed, um, people have been put into those low-lying areas and housing, all sorts of things. Likewise with our forests, we've uh, taken away huge amounts of forest from our hillsides on the left there, um, pre-human forest extent on the right, um, forest extent now, and we've introduced pests to those forests that we've kept that have then destroyed the integrity of those forests and their ability to hold water in the soils and in the, in the canopy and things like that. 
climate change, wetlands, forests, and also our rivers, right? Our rivers used to have space to spread across um, their corridors or even to move into the floodplains if they needed to. This is the Ngarudoro River upstream of some of those areas that flooded in Hawke's Bay. You can see how much space this river had back in 1950. If you draw some rough lines over it, it's sort of going operating in that area. If you compare that to now, you can see how we've taken space away from this river. And this is the case all across Aotearoa. We have narrowed river corridors to um, try and get water out to sea as fast as possible. That was the idea historically, try and keep sediment moving. Um, but actually, we've created a whole bunch of problems in doing that. Problems, for example, like um, rivers that are now building up gravel between those stop banks. This is the Tukituki River in Hawke's Bay. Down the bottom here, you can see a cross section of the river and you can see kind of how the, the floodplain naturally has this kind of um, hill, hill shape to it or, or spreading out across the floodplain. And then those stop banks have been put in. And what that means is now that the river, instead of being able to spread sediment across the floodplain, has to just build it up between the stop banks. And we have this situation where the riverbed is actually building up above the floodplain and the communities that live around that river are down on the floodplain, creating a risk if that river ever decides to evolve and jump out of that channel, um, that that water is then going down into the communities around it. Similarly, cutting space away from these rivers, particularly the gravel bedded ones, means we're cutting into the area that those rivers have to recharge groundwater, and that seems to be happening with the Waido River um, up at the top of South Island, as well as with the Salwan and the Ngarudoro Rivers, groundwater levels dropping around those rivers as a result of encroachment. We've also lost things like habitat for fish, birds, macroinvertebrates, um, not to mention swimming holes that people like hanging out in. The riffles, the little rapids, the runs, the pools in these rivers, when we straighten them, when we can find them with salt banks and willows and rocks and things, we get rid of those and destroy the integrity of those rivers and their ability to do all the things they need to do to have a healthy ecosystem. And ultimately we have this happening where essentially we have these rivers that are confined with concrete or stop banks or, or, or rock revetment, sorry, um, and then stop banks outside of that. And when these rivers flood, the water builds up deep behind those stop banks. And if those stop banks fail or are overtopped, that water then descends into the floodplain with an enormous amount of energy, which is what we've seen recently. And we know that's going to happen more and more often, right? This is a graph that shows if we built a stop bank today at the bottom left, 2023, um, across a 50-year lifetime to the bottom right, 2073, we would expect a 1% annual exceedance probability stop bank, so a 1 in 100 year stop bank to be exceeded, or, or there'd be a 40% chance across its lifetime that that stop bank would be overtopped. If that 1 in 100 year event becomes a 1 in 50 year event by 2050, which it's expected to under climate modelling, then that chance of failure becomes 62% across its lifetime. If that event becomes a 1 in 20 year event, the chance of failure across its lifetime becomes 92%. So this approach of walling in our rivers is just going to get more and more problematic. And of course, there's a cost to this. The cost of the damage from Cyclone Gabriel and Auckland floods was put at between 9 and 14.5 billion. Not to mention loss of lives and things that we haven't seen much before on the ongoing impact. Some experts wrote a paper reanimating the strangled rivers of Aotearoa New Zealand, which I think you've got access to a copy of. Last year, they said things like, working against nature does not work. We may be inadvertently manufacturing future disasters and moving out of harm's way saves lives. Very similar to some things that were written by the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment in 1988 in their inquiry into flood mitigation measures following Cyclone Bola. Things like extensive deforestation has led to greatly accelerated widespread severe erosion, draining of wetlands has intensified flooding problems in many areas, and unwise intensive development behind stop banks has often been encouraged. Last year, Forest and Bird launched this Making Room for Rivers campaign before the cyclone, little did we know, um, basically around this idea that we need more space for our rivers to flood safely, to keep communities safe and to um, retain the integrity of these rivers. This idea of having stop banks wider apart or having people out of floodplains so that rivers have more space to flood safely, to dissipate that energy and the ecosystems within them have the space they need to, to retain their integrity. And we're seeing this start to happen in different parts of the country. Greater Wellington Regional Council, for example, has bought these properties in this red area to Awakaira near the Hutt River, and they are turning that back into green space and widening the river channel by 90 metres. An extensively developed area, but they're doing what they can within those limitations to widen the river. They're changing some of their policy. They, has a ha they had a hazard mitigation policy in their regional policy statement that looked at how particular regard should be given to structural protection works. They're proposing to strike through that and insert instead considering green infrastructure, room for the river, or Matauranga or Māori options as the priority. And you might have seen Auckland Council recently uh, adopting this making space for water plan, buying people out of these problem areas, and, and sort of doing stream restoration as well. And we're seeing that come through a national policy, like the policy statement for fresh water management, loss of river extent should be avoided to the extent practicable, and a national adaptation plan that looks at prioritising nature-based solutions. And you can bring that through into things like annual plans, long-term plans, regional plans, 
30-year infrastructure plans, all that kind of stuff. And you might have seen there's a proposed national policy statement for hazard decision-making that includes this idea of nature-based solutions as well, which would be great to see councils um, submit on and support those kind of concepts. I'll finish with a quote from the PCE report and a picture. The PCE in 1988 said a possible effect of climate change is that cyclones of some form could pass close to New Zealand with increasing frequency. It may be that in retrospect, the bubble storm will not be regarded as such an extreme event. And in the interest of future generations, government cannot allow the nation's floodplain land to be unwisely used. I think we are very clearly at that point. The Rangitata River in 1937 had two branches, a north and a south branch there, north branch on the right, south branch on the left. In 2016-ish, or kind of now, that south branch was gone. In 2019, when that river flooded, it took that branch back. It went straight back where the river had been. And increasingly, we're going to be having this conversation around the country um, of rivers needing the space to flood safely. And if we don't make it for them, then they will take it. Um, and that's something we need to be thinking about long term. I've used my time. Um, We've put some resources out there and made them available to you. I think you can access them through your agenda or, or devices or something. Um, different councils doing different things and some papers, all great reading or um, worth passing on to your flood management teams. And I will leave it at that. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks, um, Tom. I um, mean, you, you have sent us a lot of information. It's a, there's a lot of pretty interesting stuff here, so that's really good. Um, we have time for some questions. Yes, Brian. Um. What are the, um, some practical suggestions in terms of a way forward? You know, you, you, you gave the example in Upper Wellington in terms of purchase of property. Um, do you have any insights around that? Because that's a hell of a challenge. I mean, last night we were at a meeting in South Dunedin and we were getting our heads around that. It, it's not a river, but it's, it's a hazard zone. Um, there's challenges like this up and down the country. Anyway, any any practical steps in, in relation to land ownership and compensation and, and timetable? Yeah, yeah. well, I think um, South Dunedin, I usually try and give an example from your region that's that's a good example of this kind of approach, and South Dunedin is a great example, I think, of where you're really thinking, obviously, it's Dunedin City plus everyone around, but um, of a great example of trying to think long term and incorporating this kind of thinking. And particularly, I liked the other day the idea that was put up of um, slowly investing uh, in different at risk locations in that area through time, through a, a fund, so that you could continue renting houses out, whatever. And then eventually, when the risk becomes too high, people can step out, you know, instead of having a disaster strike and you having to try and buy everyone else all at once. Um, that is a great approach, but not necessarily going to solve the issue, as you say, everywhere. We've got Auckland Council just doing their buyout, but saying we can't do this again. Um, we've kind of got Hawke's Bay and the government getting together to buy people out, but also saying, well, this probably isn't the long-term approach. And I'd say one of the most immediate things that you could do as a council is look at both the national policy statement or the proposed national policy statement on the hazard decision making and looking out for the climate retreat uh, document base. Well, there is actually a, a consultation on community-led retreat at the moment. Um, and, and try and look at those and how you can use those to help you because the unfortunate reality is you're probably going to end up in the situation at some point and it would be much better to have some guidance on how that's dealt with and how central government can step in and help and how those costs are shared um, in advance rather than um, after the fact. So that, that would be the big picture thing I would say. And then in terms of day to day, I would really be looking at your 30 year infrastructure plan because that's about the longest um, Point, you, you know, that's the, the almost the, the single longest piece of planning a council does, and that's the kind of time frames we need to be looking at. I talked to some people in the insurance industry that basically said getting people out of harm's way is the best approach. It's always, you know, the cost benefit pretty much always checks out. Getting people out of harm's way is better than, than leaving them in harm's way. So your 30 year infrastructure plan is, is critical, and um, then your day to day river management, and actually, you know, Councils like Greater Wellington are starting to look at how they can do things different, not just buying people out, but just day to day with erosion and not always having to step in and get in the river and whatever, small tweaks here and there. So you can do small things now and get involved in those big conversations so that you've got a solution, hopefully soon, for those when you have to deal with this um, at a bigger scale. And I think that will that will get you sort of, um, yeah, well down the line. I, I should mention as well, you've got national policy statement, freshwater plans, you know, you think about how you can tweak things around zoning or how you approach engineering rivers and try and adopt best practice stuff through those policy development processes now, rather than being stuck with kind of plans that don't actually fit the current um, climate we're seeing. Thank you, Tom. That's Thank awesome. you. Um, we have a question from Councillor Wilson. Kia ora, Tom. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't do your presentation when you came to Dunedin, so it's great that you're here. Um, 
I love what you're talking about, but the transition from what is often willow, um, willow tree lines of willow trees and transitioning into a different framework. Have you got areas of um, experience in a rural setting for that, rather than the Greater Wellington one? And that's I've been in a lot of the land and water plan meetings, and there people were wanting to understand how to do it rather than what they should do in some ways. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I would probably. Um advise you to try and find some someone who's got some direct experience in that. I know, again, Greater Wellington is doing trials with, um, uh, rather than having railway iron and wires with willows, um, looking at using, you know, untreated pine, uh, I think something like hemp rope and natives, and it was sort of willows in the first instance with natives coming up underneath. Eventually you get natives coming through, get rid of the willows, the, the untreated pine rots away rather than leaving you with all this horrible debris in the river that becomes a risk later on. Mm -hmm. They're doing stuff like that, but that is, um, it's, it's sort of semi, you know, I'm not sure if they're doing that all across the region of rural areas as well. That could be worth talking to them about, um, but I'm not sure more broadly. Well, Greater Wellington does have a Rua Mahanga River management plan that could be worth a look at. It's one of the first plans in the country that actually embeds the idea of making room for rivers. Um, and you might want to talk to some of the people there or some of your team might want to talk to the people there about their experiences. But beyond that, I'm not sure of the details. That's really awesome. Thank you very much, um, Tom. Good answers, excellent presentation. And um, at the end of the day, it's quite visionary and it's just, we just got to work. Um, it's about plotting a pathway, isn't it, and talking, looking at those 30, 50 year horizons so that we can actually don't get stuck in the moment and achieve things over time. So thank you very much for your presentation. Um, that's awesome. And thank you also, Chelsea, for sitting in as well with us. All, all good. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you very up, much. Thank you. Um, next thank up you. we've got um, Chris Arbuckle, I believe, from um, Wanaka Catchment Group, um, supported by local farms. <laughs> so Chris will let you, um, we are, Chris is well known to the council I believe, um, but we'll let you um, take it from here. Eh? I said um, you're well known to us all, but we'll let you take it, take it from here. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank Paul. you. Um, Ayla actually introduced yeah. herself. Yeah. Um, hi everyone, you won't know who I am, but I'm Ayla Meikle, so I'm uh, now the chairman of the Monica Catchment Group. Um, so I'm here um, on behalf of the group and with Chris we want to give a presentation on the Freshwater Improvement Fund project that we um, are working through. So we're now in year three of that. Um, Tom, just here as well, has taken on the project management of that. Um, Chris has moved on to a new job, so um, left a bit of space that we needed to fill. So Tom's taken that on to help deliver that for us. And we've also got Randall um, Aspinall, who some of you might know, as a farmer um, up at Mount Aspiring Station. So Randall's been heavily involved in the governance of the project and from the catchment group. Um, we're we're so a little bit worried Randall might have got a bit shy. He hasn't come up. <laughs> Don't want to the table, do we? <laughs> Um, so we just wanted to give an overview of why the Wanaka Catchment Group actually got together in the beginning. Um, so these are the values that the group um, really were centred around and I think what we really want to um, make sure is understood is that this is a farmer-led action group. So um, obviously Wade had a fantastic presentation before. Um, this is a group that they got together because they knew as farmers and landowners they it was really important to them that they're seen as a, in a positive light. Um, you know, obviously we've got the lake, and so all of the landowners that are part of our group are around Lake Wanaka. Um, they all feed in, they all have properties that basically feed into the lake, so this has always been um, a way for them to actually collaborate, collaborately get together and, um, and make sure that they are doing the right thing um, and doing it together. So, yeah, that's sort of been the gist of it. Um, so yeah, in terms of education, we just want to make sure that the community was involved in understanding what the landowners were doing um, and what they're able to do through the project. Um, the whole part of, uh, initially, of the group was actually self-funding. Um, so along, Chris basically took on, um, you know, supporting the group. And so they did a whole series of land environment plans. And then what came out of that the results that came out of that, identifying those risks has actually led into the Freshwood Improvement Fund and the actions that the group has then gone on to actually do on the ground. Um, and obviously uh, one of the values was help protect um, the future of Lake Wanaka. And then it's all about re-educating each other. So going through the process of the project, 
it's actually been like a, a benefit to see a lot of the farmers in the group that may not have had the knowledge beforehand actually get a lot out of the process. And so some of them are actually our proudest farmers that are actually out there telling the story. And we've had some really good um, uh, showcases of likes of Duncan at Alpha Burn. So, you know, he's got an amazing area of riparian work that he's done and he's actually out there having welcoming people on to look at it and, you know, doing articles and stuff like that. So. So that's, that's kind of the values of the group. And in terms of the action and focus, so um, it started off with the farm plans and so Chris um, worked through that. Um, what dropped out of that was environmental actions and then um, in, in collaboration with that, it was there's an education part and so intensive winter grazing was a focus for the group uh, pretty much last year was kind of the, the time that they really focused on that. Um, so it's a sharing knowledge. Um, we did on-farm days between the groups, um, and then, and then the FIF funding. Um, we do have a website, and um, it's just general connection um, with the group. So understanding regulations, what they mean, and supporting the group. So that's part of the function that um, that my, my involvement and others um, in the group is to make sure that we keep that connection. I'll hand over to Chris. Thanks, Ayla. Um, so I think Ayla's covered off really what we're focused on as a group. Uh, this whole um, group of farmers, particularly Randall, started getting involved with me and issues around water back in about 2014. And actually that was built out of a response to the regional plan uh, 6A. So I suppose history repeats itself as we're looking at a new change to water policy rules for the region. So I suppose what I'd like to emphasise is that the whole focus was really to do stuff on farm but also focus on the critical need to fix water, and that's my love and background. So fortunately, through the farm plans, we identified a number of sites that we knew that we had to fix, um, and essentially built out four primary project areas to kind of look at ways that we could improve the waterways that feed into Lake Wanaka. The, um, with some of the cool stuff that we're doing, we've, we've got a, another school day coming up, so we work very closely with the Wanaka schools, getting them out on farm. We take the whole of um, Takura school out there's over 200, was it 270 students now? Yeah. yeah. Out on the Randall's farm, which is a reasonably big task. And uh, so in the lower left there, you can kind of see a whole suite of children playing in the creek, learning about waterways, but actually out on the farm. And as um, Ayla mentioned, we've done a little bit of sort of advertising to people what we're doing. But in all honesty, we just wanted to get our heads down and do positive things for the farming community. I don't want to spend too much time on this very busy slide, but one of the partnership projects I encouraged with the Regional Council was a good water quality project. Fortunately we received um, support from the Council to do more fine scale monitoring of our waterways. The main reason for that is um, if you only sample the main stem waterways going to Lake Wanaka, you kind of get a bit, a bit of a twisted view because they're actually very good water quality. But through further sampling in those um, nice big bands, the big boxes there showed us that we had some of the smaller waterways that wouldn't meet the requirements of the NPS freshwater management. And we also focused our attention on fixing those, because if you fix the capillaries, you help the arteries, and the heart of the lake actually retains its quality. So my focus was actually getting information that would improve the overall status of the waterways and the catchment. And we worked very closely with the Regional Council, Melanie, and we sampled for about 18 months at 48 sites. So we had a really good snapshot of the state of the waterways and our catchment. So that enabled me to work with the farmers around critical sites to fix. So there was about 29 sites distributed through their farm plans that we knew were problem spots. And, um, and this is an update of our, our Waiora project sites. And, and Tom's been doing some excellent work kind of building on plans for this, this current year. So we've had two years of work in the catchment. Um, we've ticked off a number of sites, and I'll get to some more statistics in a minute, but we do detailed plans, riparian fencing plans for each site. Um, the fencing is subsidised by 50% for the farmer. We have a, a sponsorship deal with Goldpine that cheapens things up a bit for fencing as well. And we uh, put about 2,000 plants in sight. So that sort of gets the ball rolling. Um, and I suppose the main reason for this project was uh, people like Randall got on board. He was innovative. He sort of jumped on board and started doing stuff. But I thought to myself, it won't be fast enough. We need to spin it up. So. We received about a million dollars from MFE through the FIF projects to support our initiatives. So to date, we're sort of 
got to the focus of fixing um, streams in their full length. So if you think about the Alpha Burn, when I started, um, actually Duncan had done some fantastic work putting aside a wetland system, but the main stem of the Alpha Burn was completely unfenced for a majority of its distance. Through working at an initial project with Waimonika's um, water project, we had a site right down, right down the bottom, which is called the Fish Pond, and, and that got fenced pretty early on, and it's kind of one of those go-to sites. People drive past it. There's over 5,000 people that camp in the campground um, watching what's going on on Duncan's property, so it was a good one to show that we've got initiatives on the go. But the real hard work was upstream, and there's a picture there of um, it's a nice R2 uh, stock standing beside the waterway. So when we were sampling that, we were showing we had hot spots where your stock had access. That site is now fully fenced and planted. So as we move up the catchment, we've managed to fence the whole waterway. So that fixes the waterway, well, basically the whole water quality challenge for that waterway going forward. We've had some perverse outcomes, um, putting aside areas or riparian zones. We've got willows coming back because sheep are not getting in there and grazing it. And uh, also at the lower reach, uh, that one up the top there, Duncan's got some challenges with the fact that there's a lot of sediment being re-eroded. So we've made room for rivers, and now those rivers are kind of reforming their channels. And that's flowing through the campground, which is a wee bit of worry for them. So what's on the ground? So we had over 2,400 um, 2, people hours worked across the project. Uh, we put in over six, close to six and a half kilometres of fencing, and if any farmers in the room know how much that would cost, um, most of it's a good chunk of it's deer fencing as well. So we set aside pretty much over three kilometres of waterways that are protected now within the catchment. Again, if, if you're small-minded, you might not think that's much, but they're small waterways, and the ones that were being affected by stock access and challenges of water quality. Uh, we put in close to sort of 6,000 eco-source plants. We work with Matukitugi natives. All our plants come from the catchment, and um, what we've done is our planting regimes match the vegetation that would have been there when um, I was a lad, which is a long time ago. So in that sense, we're making sure we're putting plants in the right place. And we've also um, put aside over 15 hectares of farm land for the betterment of freshwater quality. There's people make these projects work, and the people on those slides and some names there have been critical to its success. Um, particularly Randall's been a key driver, and Grant um, Radenclaw was the chair before um, Ayla. Uh, Ayla's a younger version, and, and way more pretty one, I might add. But in all reality, um, you don't get these things done without people committing to it, and it's quite a critical part of this community. And as Mandy mentioned, it's, it's about collaboration, but also working on the things that matter to your group, and that's what we're sort of focused on as the Wanaka Catchment Group. So, questions? of the community on our farm, so it's telling a story and getting involved in the whole community work, which I think is awesome. Another couple of wee one-liners, uh, get our heads down and do the positive things, um, get on get on doing stuff, so um, well done and you've been around and making a difference. Do we, do we have any questions for the what? Mm -hmm. oh, Councillor Horson, yeah? Sorry. Um, when you've done the riparian set-offs, can you just explain in the cattle areas and the sheep areas, I think you've got both, um, what your set off is from the waterways? So we designed that around what essentially were the, at presently, the winter grazing rules. So minimum of five metre setback. But because we're concerned about the price of fencing and the cost of, um, I suppose, getting things in the ground, uh, strainer posts and the like, we end up with some areas that got a 40 metre setback because we're doing straight line fencing. So it varies. Um, where we've got a bit of slope and paddocks, uh, we kind of manage around that too from the point of view of just and that focus on winter grazing. We've always had making sure that we're managing the land around it. So all those sites pretty much on the average are five metres plus back from the waterway. Yeah, I would reiterate that, that that's the reason why we wanted to do detailed riparian plans for each site because every site's different yeah. and actually every location that we almost that the, the landowners have, some of them are quite different as well. Makarora is very different to, um, to up the Matuki Tuki, so. So, so follow up question if I may. Oh yeah, quick one. Just understanding the cost, what is the plant, your fencing cost as a component of your whole project, proportionately, do you know? Uh, it's about 80% put into fencing and plants, yeah. So it's stuff on the ground. The plants, are, plants are fully funded by the project. Thank you.
Thank you. Brian? Um, so have you achieved improvements in water quality and, and where to from here? Um, so it'd be nice to have a, another regional council project that we could do to follow up on some of the initiatives here. So the Alpha Burn, I know through the years of research on fresh water, we've improved it, haven't measured it, don't probably need to, in the sense that all the science points to the fact that you protect waterways and you improve water quality. And there's some good science being done in the catchment and further work being done by Y that kind of supports that too. Um, I have to thank people like Randall for allowing a, a leap of faith in putting a lot of money on the ground to fix water quality without a hell of a lot of science to prove it. But in all reality, we have information on the um, Matuki Tuki that's showing some improvement. But I wouldn't be bold to say that's us. I reckon it's climate, a whole pile of other things happening in that catchment. So, yeah. I think it's, um, it's probably a lot to do with education and behaviour change too. Yeah. Like we've got a lot of, we're doing these sites, but a lot of our properties have got a lot of those sites on them. So where we are doing this riparian planning in that particular spot, there's an obvious and specific improvement. But across the catchment as a whole, I would expect that probably the education and the stuff around land management and landowners and staff understanding the impact they're having with their day-to-day -day decisions is probably having and is probably having as big an impact and probably has the potential to have a far greater impact than the riparian sites in particular. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Rep. Um, Tom Miffin. The decision really is pretty cheap from the margin of strips. What sort of damage do you see them doing? They eat plants. Hang on a minute. Hey, Randall, could you come up to a microphone so the people online can hear? Sorry, Lloyd, it's the councillors we can't hear online. Yeah, um, that's good. Hopefully we got sorted now, hopefully. Try again. Try start again, Tom, yeah. Okay, so the, the question's just around excluding sheep from um, grazing on the marginal strips. Um, and, you know, what, why was that decision made? Um, what is the damage they cause? Um, and it's a question that's coming up through our land and water management plan that we're seeing as well. Uh, so no damage. The, the reason for sheep fencing is to protect the plants. So the plants aren't eaten by the sheep. In terms of, yeah, we, we bar winter grazing and very heavy stocking in wet conditions, we see minimal to no sheep damage mm -hmm. yeah, to so the margins. Yeah, so no, so no water damage, uh, no water quality issues around sheep on those marginal strips. But not not under sort of general moderate mm. stocking, mm. like winter grazing and when you're mob stocking yeah. in large mobs, especially in wet conditions, you would see specific short term effects, yeah. but yeah. under normal most of the year round okay. stocking we don't. And, that, and that's why we match the winter grazing focus on fencing stuff off, so you can't carry both, cover both those issues. From a catchment management perspective and looking at the animals that affect water quality, um, basically through a lot of science that's been done in the past, including work that I did on impacts on um, catchment processes, sheep don't really play a big role in causing water quality problems unless the mob stopped and unless they're close to waterway. So, but they actually have a, quite a benefit with the management of pest plants and that's what we're seeing in some of the sites that we've fenced off. We've got willows and ragwort and stuff coming back that otherwise are taken out by sheep. So. You can't have your cake and eat it too. The reality is you, you actually have to think holistically about what happens going forward with those sites. Yeah. So. That's, that's excellent. Thanks, guys. Um, 2014 you started before it, um, before it got trendy, I guess. So well done. You've been there and you've led, your, um, you've led the charge and just out there doing it. So thank you very much for giving your time to come here today. It's been, been excellent. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Next up we have um, Matt Hollier from, I think we might have read a, um, something from yourself at some stage, Matt, regarding bringing a whole lot of entities together into one. That's correct, yeah. yeah. 
Um, and I'm joined by Michaela Blacklock, who's been working with me and, uh, and others on this project. Kia ora. Thank you. Kia ora, thank you for your time. Um, so yes, I did make a submission uh, in your May meeting in, in Dunedin with regards to the concept of, uh, of a conservation alliance across the Wanaka and Queensland area. So um, we're here representing sort of three key organisations from, from across this upper lake trophy that are committed to working together for some more impactful outcomes for the natural environment. So that's uh, Manatahuna, Southern Lake Sanctuary and Wai Wanaka. Um, we're, by no means do we represent all the conservation and environmental organisations in this rohi. Uh, there are many, and there are many hundreds of people that contribute to, uh, to, to the outcomes that, that we're all hoping for. But we're, we're three of the largest um, organisations, and we do play a role in supporting many of these other smaller entities to do the great work that they do. Um, each of our three organisations have a different but connected remit, with each bringing expertise and focus to their respective missions. So, um, Mana Tahuna is a kaupapa Māori organisation committed to positive social, cultural and environmental development for the Wakatipu community. They are working in partnership with others on the restoration of freshwater catchment in the Wakatipu, and I'm sure you're familiar with their work, especially around Lake Hayes. Um, the Southern Lake Sanctuary is a consortium of six um, local predator control groups working collectively across the Wanaka and uh, Wakatipu Basin areas to protect and restore the declining biodiversity of the Southern Lakes region. And uh, why Wanaka, who you've heard, for, heard from with Mandy and Prue, um, a Wanaka based trust with a focus on accelerating action for our freshwater in the Upper Clutha. Um, so these three organisations sit at the heart of a quiet and effective ecosystem of skilled and passionate people. Um, they're both, both paid and, and, and volunteers who are working to achieve some solid outcomes. Um, so although we've achieved a lot separately, there's an opportunity to deliver on the long term aspirations of the community and the strategic direction of OSC through more formal collaboration and coordination. Um, there was a report previously done through um, Anne Duncan tabled it through, um, through the ORC just recently, so it was, it was along that concept of the integrated management plan. Um, and it's our view that, um, as was found in some comments in that report, that it's our view that we can do better together and be stronger together. Um, but to do this, we'll need ORC's support. So an Upper Lakes Conservation Alliance across conservation and environmental organisations is proposed as the mechanism through which to provide deeper and more efficient conservation outcomes and more effective engagement for ORC in, in this raw here. Um, so we are aware of in Auckland, Bay of Plenty, the top of the South Island with um, Kotahi Tangamote Tao. There are groups working in a way that's quite similar and we've begun conversations with some of those groups to inform our approach and to learn from what it is that they've been doing. Um, and I guess the ask that we've got of Otago Regional Council is um, for you to consider how this initiative could be supported potentially with an alternative approach to rating that would see new resource made available to conservation and environmental initiatives across, across the, the um, Upper Lakes Rohi. Um, so today, as Matt said, we represent just these three organisations. However, in principle, um, conversations have been had uh, with lots of other groups and there's been general support for the intent of establishing an alliance. Those other groups have said that they see great value in pursuing the pathway to an inclusive, supportive, impactful delivery mechanism for environmental initiatives in our rohe more broadly. And we know that there's more engagement required. Um, there'll be quite a process for us to go through over the coming months, um, including with mana whenua. But we've made a start and we're committed to open and constructive dialogue with those groups to design an alliance in a way that serves the need best. The overarching motivation of the concept is to connect expertise and share knowledge more effectively and to enable more efficient delivery on our collective objectives. And the foundation for this, we see, is to unlock new longer-term sustainable funding that will enable an unwavering focus on the bigger picture and the ability to deliver enduring landscape-scale outcomes for the natural environment. There's potential that, um, should those funding streams be unlocked, that there is opportunity to also leverage alternative sources of funding over time. These three organisations and those that we work with have a track record of successful outcomes and we've seen a whole range of those successful outcomes already today. Um, it's been great to see those other presentations. Um, we've got a track record of effective coordination across groups and what this concept is seeking is support to build on those past successes to accelerate and deepen our collective impact over time. So the Conservation Alliance is not a concept that's a proposal to create a new bureaucracy. Um, we're here to present the concept of a collective that serves and is driven by the local community and Otago Regional Council. We believe that it should be developed in probably a two to three stage process over two years with the aim of proving 
effective and value for money for ratepayers, conservation groups, and the natural environment, and that this alliance would become an enduring entity for delivering good for all. We envisage that we start this community-based alliance in the Upper Lakes area, and in the knowledge that it's a six, that if it's a success, could lead to expansion across the wider Otago region. So, for your consideration, we believe that this concept has the ability to contribute to deliver on five of the OIC um, vision statements that you've got with regards to communities that are connected, people that are working together, get connection, they understand each other, and they're caring for the environment at the same time. Um, communities that are resilient in the face of um, natural hazards and um, climate change and all that sort of stuff uh, are, are going to be better served through um, collaboration as well. Um, trying to create an environment that's, that supports healthy people and e ecosystems. Um, Te Ao Māori and Matauranga Kai Tahu are embedded in the Otago communities and that's certainly something we need to include in this. Um, and ideally we're trying to create a sustainable way of life for everyone in Otago as, as you outline in your own strategic direction. So we've, we've seen examples across the country of where there's collective power and, and we believe that this, this way of working together in, at a, in an at-scale alliance um, would be incredibly effective and powerful. We have some key principles that we've agreed on amongst our, our, our small group which are with regards to you know, projecting the gains that have been made to date. There's a lot of good stuff that's happened through volunteer work um, and through the recent Jobs for Nature that's, um, that's made a contribution as well. Um, there's some opportunities to enhance efficiencies amongst the groups um, and help people spend more time out there doing stuff that they want to do rather than necessarily filling out forms or writing documentation themselves. There's a lot of people that really want to make a contribution um, and not always best served sitting in a room. <laughs> and uh, and by doing so, you'll be able to sustain greater and more positive impacts on the natural environment. So what we propose is um, preparing a, a robust proposal through to the OIC that would outline the costs and benefits of what we see an alliance could have. And we'd like to do that um, with, with your, your, your support. Um, and we'll have a few questions that we'll direct through to management with regards to how we best do that. But you know, we'd like to, you know, do, does the OIC see value in an alliance you know, of this sort of nature? Um, do they see value on the impact and the enduring outcomes that could result from people working together? Um, could an alliance help to deliver effectively on objectives that you've got you set yourselves and that the community has given you? Um, and you know, we'll get to the point of putting a proposal through for your consideration within the long-term plan um, because we'd like to think that this is something that has got um, effective outcomes that will come through at a landscape scale, um, but we will need resources to make sure that can happen. Um, Sorry, Paul, can you talk into your microphone a bit? Sorry. Um, so just, just in conclusion for this stuff here, we're basically at the point where we're getting to be at the point of being able to put together a proposal through to through the council for your consideration. Um, we'll, we'll have some questions which we'd like to direct through through management um, with regards to some ideas and um, aspects of this proposal we've got with regards to the value that they could see from the alliance, um, the outcomes that can be generated from it. Um, and hopefully we can see your support through the through the protocols over the coming months. That's awesome. Thank you very much for that. Uh, another visionary one, which is good. Do we have any questions for Paul and Karen? Yes, Rachel. Happy birthday, I think. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That wasn't my question. <laughs> looks like, um, yeah, you're celebrating today. Um, so that is great that you were with us. Um, so thanks for coming. Um, I was just wondering, um, in terms of what you're asking of OIC, just um, it sounded there as though um, there's something around um, the work that you mentioned with Anne Duncan that was important around bringing together um, a catchment action plan, I think it was. Uh, so is that an important role for the council in helping to form, I'm trying to f figure out what, our role is that you're thinking about mm. forming, helping to bring the alliance together through bringing parties together, or is that happening anyway? Um, and then also the other one was, I think, specifically that you spoke about an alternative model for rating needed, and that you're going to bring a proposal as well. So um, we'll get more detail, obviously, through the proposal that's brought forward. But whether you wanted to touch on those two? Yeah, thank you. Um, you're right, we're not sure what, and I guess it's up to ORCs to desire to be involved with it. There is already community groups working together um, and collaborating, but um, being able to sort of, um, and I think the words are similar to what Mandy said, you know, getting out, of, getting out of bed each morning and knowing what you're doing and where you're trying to go, 
and there's a lot of um, a lot of hard work that needs to be done. But you also need to have that vision and direction, and um, having people that are working towards that and and being able to corral and coordinate people. The Upper Clutha Biodiversity Strategy is a fantastic document for giving an example of lots of people fed into it. Yep. But how do you drive that forward, and whose role is that to drive that forward? Um, I see scope for the community doing that um, with support from the ORC. Um, ORC could take a leadership role if they want to. We're not tied to anything in particular, but we see a way where when you've got some great people doing good stuff that you can support them, um, and part of that support needs to come through having some continuity of funding. Um, there's a lot of organisations that are bootstrapping what they do. You've got the generosity of some, 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 some farmers individually doing that sort of stuff, as we've heard from the Aspinall family. Um, but to sustain what's done and keep it going for a long time and have these groups, rather than having short bursts of funding, and then the work fades away and the effectiveness doesn't last. You need to have a long-term plan to look ahead and be able to deliver on it. Um, so there could be accountabilities mastered through, um, through a governance structure um, with a, a mixture of RIC and community groups involved and then the doing side of things can be done through these groups. That's awesome, thank you. We have a question from um, Edward online. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, it really was probably a question I had for Y Wanaka as well, but I see the Alliance is working with all three presenters today and it's really, I'd like to uh, understand the, the initiative or the strategy that the Alliance would have to clearly establish a relationship with Mana Whenua, particularly if uh, the Alliance is going to be coming to the ORC or anywhere else. Or funding and support, we would, would want some clarity on how that is actually proposed to work. Um, Pro, do you, do you want to join us? Yeah, Pro from Waiwanaka can join us in a bit there. Um, certainly, the, the intention is absolutely to engage and do this properly um, through the protocols that, um, that works with Mana Whenua. Um, and I know that I'm in a day job, I'm working with, I work for Southern Lake Sanctuary as their operations manager and Pro at Waiwanaka has certainly been involved with, with that side of engagement as well. Yeah, yeah um, thanks for the question Edward. I think from, from Waiwanaka's perspective we're working with um, Kawati and have a comms protocol with both Okaha and um, Te Marama to start understanding um, uh, you know, where our projects align with the priorities of mana whenua and, and start to build those relationships. I think by aligning with Otago Regional Council and Queenstown Lakes District Council, knowing that they're working closely with um, tangata whenua is, is where we also hope to, to align. So yeah, definitely keen to talk further about how we can, um, can engage mana whenua in this particularly Conservation Alliance and the work of Waiwanaka. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, uh, Matt and Kayla, for coming along today. It's awesome. Uh, we've got people here that care, and, and I'm sure we'll be hearing more of a possible alliance in the future. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is from, um, from Southern Lake Century, Paul Kavanagh. So would all of you like to come up? So. Um, Southern Lake Century, based in Queenstown, largely involved in biodiversity projects, so Paul's leading the charge there. So Paul, we'll leave it to you. Kia ora. Thank you. Yeah, so ko Paul Kavanagh toko ngoa, e ko tene takumihi ki na tangana whenua o te rohine. So my name is Paul and I'm, I joined the Southern Lake Sanctuary far now in 2021, initially as a trustee and then I was hired as project director. So kind of there on the journey from fairly early days, but we're kind of operationally two years into our journey. So a huge thank you to ORC for your continued support of our, our journey, which is hopefully just getting started. Um, so kind of crunching some initial numbers, um, pre-project, again, there's about 6,400 traps across the Rohi, across our project area. We're now about to hit 10,000, which is really cool. Uh, I don't want to get too stuck in the weeds at this presentation. I think I've got the graveyard shift, so I'll keep it short and prompt. Um, but the key thing on this slide, I think, is the, the community groups that we're working with. Um, nearly close to 90 groups at this stage. And I think that's been the recurring theme across everyone's talks today. 
conservation and environmentalism is all about people, and it's all about people working together. And we're all about that kind of collective impact through cons collaboration for conservation. So, because that's where opportunities arise. Um, RC did generously support us with eco funds um, as part of a proposed translocation of Mohua into Matukituki Valley. Um, so actually last week we installed about 114 bait stations. So this is a dock-led translocation. Uh, if we can just stop the beech trees masting to keep rat numbers down, that will hopefully be going ahead long term, which is really exciting up in um, Randall can count Mohua from his deck hopefully in the future. Um, and Mohua is just a start. We have some grand plans about not just Mohua, but robin translocations and fio, um, returning some of our lost species, some of our lost tango species to where they should be across the Rohi. Um, I was lucky enough to be at the translocation, the release for Takahe in Greenstone Valley um, in Kaitahu land. So it is incredibly inspiring and humbling to all of us in the conservation fan out to see that sort of work happening. That's why we do this. We get up every day to not to kill things, it's to save things. Um, and it's really important we don't lose sight of that as well. So recently we got, uh, and also I should say with Takahe, where we've got grand plans long term for hopefully Takahe translocations across some of the high country stations in our operational Rohi. So we started some of that initial work um, up the Reese Valley as well. So really exciting. Um, in that vein, we need to know the direction we're going long term. And a huge part of that is um, knowing what was there before humans were here. So ORC have previously engaged wildlands to do some floral mapping. So what plants would have been across our district pre-humans. We've gotten wildlands to build on that through funding from QLDC. And um, so we've done some faunal mapping. Everything we do will be completely open sourced and widely available. So QLDC are just getting that ready for public consumption, I guess. <laughs> but we'd like to make that available through ORC's maps as well. And um, that will hopefully give a kind of broad strokes tool for determining restoration goals for all of our community groups, everyone working towards the same lofty goals. Um, and we really need to keep sight of the fact that healthy functioning ecosystems are really important in climate change mitigation and reminding ourselves of the strong links between biodiversity and climate change as well. So a key part of our project is innovation. Um, we are not going to achieve these lofty goals of Takahe everywhere if we're using box traps. And um, we need to expand our repertoire, expand our arsenal of, of methodologies, both for monitoring and trapping. And again, everything we do, we want to share that as widely as possible. So some key ones I've talked previously at my submission in May around our work with eDNA. We're using it also for water sampling, but we've been doing a lot of proof of concept work for trialing it for lizard monitoring. Because across the Rohi, we've got about 18 species of lizards that we know about, but 16 of them are endangered to some degree. They're really cryptic. They're really, they look pretty alike, and I'm a reptile nerd. Um, so where an animal is rare and cryptic, they're difficult to monitor, which means they're difficult to conserve as well. So we've been using eDNA in kind of with tubes with filter brushes in reptile habitat, Moco Moco Sanctuary and Alex as a trial, and um, really, really promising results. Um, when they're sent away to the lab, you can, get, you can then build a picture of the population health and density and stuff. Really cheap um, comparatively to traditional methods of monitoring as well. And then other monitoring systems, we're working with um, Dr. Laura Moles from the Virum Group. Um, she's a smart cookie and she's developed an algorithm for Mohua songs using software to identify individual Mohua. Because a big concern across some of our really fragmented wildlife populations is that you get really skewed sex ratios. So Mohua populations, there's a concern that it's really male heavy, lots of males with not many females around. So when we're just counting individual, when we can count individuals, it really gives us a much better picture, which means we can conserve them much better. And we're also doing peka peka monitoring, uh, giant weta. We're so lucky to have some of the lesser loved uh, species like southern alpha giant weta that really need our, our immediate attention. Um, and then really targeted species monitoring like Kaurere and Fio and Kia. Um, we, through part funding from ORC, we hosted a conservation standards workshop in May 2022. And I think ORC have adopted the conservation standards fully now, which is great to see. Because again, in conservation, we have to be really adaptive in our approach. Um, monitoring allows us to make much more informed decision. 
and a lot of our community groups historically were just trapping, trapping, trapping without much monitoring. We've been trying to instill and support the groups to do much more monitoring because we need to know that we're making a difference. Um, and then that helps guide us to use our, use our resources as efficiently as possible. So some of our new techniques, um, Mandy touched on earlier about the AT220s, which are incredible self-resetting um, possum rodent trap. We're using them with the integrated management system. So from the office, we can see battery levels, bait levels, what they're catching, when they're catching. Because these traps are, in essence, always on, we can also use them much um, more sparsely than other traps. So that negates some of the cost difference. And um, they've got an AI camera as well. So in about two weeks' time, we'll be able to arm these traps to only fire when the AI recognizes a possum. So that means we can then roll out this technology in some of the high country areas where we've Kia, because currently we don't have a Kia safe possum trap. But they're also really bloody efficient as well. Um, did a tally of trap, what we've caught um, with our arsenal of just over 100 AT220s, 1,800 possum today which is incredible. So 23 of these traps caught um, about 600 possums in 11 months. Over the same time period, we took a sample of 23 other traps that caught 21. So much more, much more efficient. And this is what paid staff can bring to the community groups. We can then get boots on the ground working in difficult areas, doing work they don't want to do or can't do, and trialing some tech like this for much better efficiencies. So looking to the future, um, we've also commissioned Wildlands to do some work around elimination sites. So we're currently suppressing predators. We're getting the numbers down to low numbers, low enough numbers that our native species can cling on. What we need to look at long term is getting predator numbers down to zero in some of those areas. Then we can look at having not just our wildlife surviving, having our wildlife thriving, and that's the goal. So Wildlands have identified five elimination sites that would be great for getting numbers down to zero and maintaining it using landscape barriers. And um, key one for us, obviously, is our long-term security, because as I said, in May, when we submitted, um, we don't have secure funding past 1st of July. We need to maintain our gains, or they, they will be lost pretty quick. Um, long-term, we need to do more. We need, the need is urgent and the need is great. We need to keep developing, keep expanding all of our, our mahi. And that's all about collaboration again. So it's great seeing so many of our conservation fan out here today. Um, but securing our, our futures first and foremost. So I said I'd keep it short and brief. Hopefully that was short and brief. But we also want to leave a little taste there. And we'd love for councillors an open invite to you guys. If you ever want to come out in the field and see some of our work in action, uh, we'd love to host you guys. So please do get in touch. And I think that's all from me. So kia ora, thank you for your time, and that, thanks again. That's awesome, Paul. Um, we've met a couple of times. Um, I've written down here, it's about the birds. That's sort of something for m myself, to be honest. It's a bit about the birds for me and uh, my um, building forests. And uh, Moho is also a, a bird that's endangered on the, in my home's patch, so it's really awesome. But I then also wrote, wrote down, it's not just about the birds, it's about lizards and pecker pecker and, and everything that comes, comes with the job. So excellent work. Um, any questions for Paul? Which pretty much covered the field. We're quick, quick. The efficient way for us to come out and see your site, if we were to take up that opportunity, would be to go together, is yep. that, I presume. And that's yep. one for us to do together. Thank you. I just want to check that out. Yeah, I can circulate my, my details and we can try to tee up a date. I think you'd have Alexa to answer to if you didn't come together and everyone drove separately. Yeah. So. No, that's, that's excellent. Thanks, Paul. Thank you very much for your time and coming along and presenting to us here today. And Thank you for your time. We'll take it from there. So, and uh, our last speaker today is Nancy Latham from the Friends of Bullock Creek. And um, hopefully we'll have the pleasure of um, Nancy's company maybe tomorrow maybe for a bit tomorrow. of a look around for some of the... Was it? Or maybe this afternoon. <laughs> Uh, no, it's actually, um, I talked to Roger, it's tomorrow at four, tomorrow afternoon at four, if you're That's welcome to visit us at the wetlands. So, councillors, thank you. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to introduce, introduce myself, as I've been copying some of you into correspondence to the Kia DC Mayor around stormwater flooding issues in the headlands of Bullock Creek and the Bloys Bay catchment, so, it's, so you can put a face to the name. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Friends of Bullock Creek and our community stakeholders, the Guardians of Lake Wanaka, Wanaka Lake Swimmers Club and Touchstone, 
And we've also been collaborating closely with Fish and Game and the Monica Retirement Village. Friends of Bullock Creek is a strong community mandate to protect, restore and enhance the environs of Bullock Creek, which is a unique spring-fed creek which runs through the heart of Wanaka here in, uh, through here in Wanaka and enters Lake Wanaka at the Dinosaur Park just down here. I attended the Deep Water Lakes workshop last week, which was immensely informative. The extent of freshwater water monitoring and understanding was enlightening. And the extent and the intent to coordinate this this evidence-based knowledge will provide good support for our mandate. Um, for example, three institutions are currently monitoring freshwater quality just next door in Bullock Creek at the Library Bridge. Bringing these regimes together will help create a profile in trends in freshwater quality in Bullock Creek and ultimately Lake Wanaka. I'm working with Brock Clark, OIC catchment advisor to develop, to delve deeper into the state of environment data series to identify the sensitive parameters, to chart trends and compare with other creeks such as Horn Creek, suggested Timaru Creek, but that might be a bit extreme, that would be the pristine um, creek, um, but rural creeks such as say Luggett Creek. Um, this will help portray a picture to support our submissions and also to build a, you know, a picture for the community awareness. Of serious concern is that QLDC have deferred mitigating investment in stormwater assets in the Roy's Bay catchment up for seven years to 2030. This leaves our creeks and Lake Wanaka, as well as our local communities, vulnerable to another seven years of stormwater contamination and inundation. On Monday, I copied some of you into a letter supporting the QLDC Mayor Lua's call for central government candidates to initiate pol policy initiatives and levers to support local government investment in infrastructure to protect the well-being of our community and creeks and lakes. The, it's the funding that's, <laughs> that's the problem, isn't it, at this stage? So, you know, it, the, perhaps needs to be a bit of um, pushback in, in, in terms of how local government are funded. This letter um, includes a brief summary of scientific knowledge showing the decline of the ecological health of Bullock Creek and Lake Wanaka. Now, I, I can send this through to you all actually later because um, I haven't been, I haven't actually. Recording in progress. Oh, good. Um, no, for example, the delta out here, when the lake was really low, it, you could see how far it's extending out, the sediment delta out towards the towards the uh, marina. Um, and this, this is sort of as a reflection of sediment coming down Bullock Creek. There was also a quote within this letter from the Wanaka Lake Swimmers Club in the submission to the annual plan for the QLDC. And um, it says, to quote from the Wanaka Lake Swimmers Club, re referencing the alarming increase in poor quality and how high E. coli levels in Roy's Bay after rain events. They defer swimming to, for at least 24 hours after st stormwater enters Roy's Bay. There's also an aerial photo um, of discharge from stormwater after rain going into Bremner Bay, which it's, it's quite um, disconcerting really to see the extent that stormwater actually goes out into the to the bay, and probably if we had records for um, Roy's Bay, because Bullock Creek, Stony Creek and Middle Creek all go into Roy's Bay without any treatment, there'd be a similar picture portrayed for Roy's Bay as well. So the lack of funding for CapEx investment has been cited for QLDC's reason for deferring and mitigating investment. Um, as the background, the resource consent for the original urban development subdivision south of the headwaters of Bullock Creek was for all stormwater to be soaked to ground. This did not occur due to failure in design. Only 5% soaked to ground. Ground monitoring was required under the original resource consent, but no surface water baselines were required or established. The regulatory framework requires evidential support, which has been undermined by the lack of these surface water baselines. Hence, there's serious contention around the legal definition of pre-development flows. So building and coordinating evidence-based knowledge, along with providing the community with a picture of trends, will enable 
changes in how we manage urban stormwater runoff in our creeks and lakes, as Mandy was referring to, you know, it's the educational side of things and, and putting in rain tanks or just not putting um, pollutants down stormwater drains really helps. So, and also one suggestion I'd like to make in terms of ORC and monitoring is to establish a freshwater monitoring regime which is located at the Stone Street border of the wetlands. This is pre-urban areas in Wanaka. So this will provide a strategic baseline for water quality trends. So we will be submitting on the land and water regional plan and I'm happy to answer questions and as I said, Show you, well, Roger will show you around the wetlands tomorrow afternoon at four. You're most welcome at Stone Street. And we'll see you later at Edgewater. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. Do we have any questions? Well, if not, we um, thank you very much for coming along. It's um, very informative and it's, it's the passion. You can feel, see the passion of the people for the environment coming through and that's what makes our, our role so special as well. So thank you very much for sharing piece of your piece of your work with us thank you thank you um thank you. i think at that stage i'd just like to just reiterate just like to thank all the speakers that have made the effort to come and talk to us today and you've all got your your own your own stories in your own areas of expertise and you're all making a difference and we thank you very much for that and um it's just really important that we're always um keeping the communication lines open between um the people on the ground and the people like of us uh, sitting around the table I think right now I'd just like to propose we have an adjournment for a quarter of an hour, we'll say five, five to three, just for a quick cup of coffee and then we can start off in the remainder of our more formal part of our committee meeting. Okay, so we're all good to go, so we'll reconvene the meeting um, and get into the actual more committee part of the meeting. So first of all, just get confirmation of the agenda. So, any additions? Okay, Kate's happy to move. Seconder. Thanks, Andrew. All those in favour, say aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, declarations is uh, declarations of interest. So just like any other meeting, be aware that um, if you have a conflict, to declare the conflict. Um, and then we'll start. Uh, we're going to start the meeting now with a presentation from from um, even. Um, Eve and Nick, who I assume are based up here in Wanaka, are going to give us some, um, or well, based somewhere. Yeah? Dunedin. <laughs> Dunedin, Dunedin, Queenstown. Sorry for that. That's um, right. Around some special new technology that you're going to awesome. show us. That'd be awesome, thank you. Yeah, I'll just quickly, um, so yeah, so you've met Eve before through some of the LTP conversations. She's our environmental monitoring manager based in Dunedin. Nick's based in our Queenstown office. Um, and we're just going to talk through uh, some of the work that EM are doing. It ties in really nicely with some of the public forum that you've just heard. So I'll hand over to them. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, and some of you will have seen a little bit of the stuff that I'm going to present before when I did my current state presentation, um, but it's been updated a little bit. So um, environmental monitoring, new and emerging technology. Uh, Nick's going to talk to that later in the presentation, but I'm just going to run you really quickly through where we're at with the environmental monitoring team. Um, so just as a bit of an FYI, we've undergone a restructure recently. So this is what our very impressive structure now looks like. Um, prior to this, it was a very flat structure with literally everybody reporting up to one person, which is is not ideal, but this is going to give us a lot more scope for expansion within the team and just focusing um, in on some of the disciplines a bit more closely, uh, allowing people to specialise if that's what they're choosing to do. Um, so 26 is our current number in the environmental monitoring team to cover all of Otago. Okay, uh, just briefly, state of environment monitoring, which is what we are charged with doing, um, in addition to work with engineering uh, hazards, etc. But the state of the environment monitoring feeds down to us through the science program. Uh, so currently we have 107 water level sites, but actually we've just put an additional one in, so that's now 108. Uh, 75 
flow ratings, the discharge ratings that we have to look after and make sure they're accurate on a daily basis. Uh, 97 groundwater level sites and I believe there's another 11 have just gone in in Maniatoto, so the groundwater aspect of our program is really starting to grow. 36 rainfall sites uh, and we've recently just put another one in in the rock and pillars above middle March uh, for the hazards team. Uh, water quality sampling, we currently have 227 sites that we monitor. 57 groundwater sites which we monitor quarterly, 8 Tyree scroll playing groundwater sites which are monitored monthly, 107 surface water sites which are our state of the environment sites across the region so they're monitored monthly, 34 SOE lake trophic sites which are monitored monthly uh, and 24 contact recreation sites which are monitored over the summer period from December to March so that will be that program we're just starting to prepare for now. Uh, continuous water quality, we have 15 surface water sites around the region that are monitoring dissolved oxygen, temperature, nitrate and turbidity. Not all of those sites monitor all of those parameters. Um, we have four lake buoys uh, which we are monitoring. <laughs> they are, yeah, can be problematic at times but they are in a very challenging environment in those big lakes. Um, and the lake boys are monitoring dissolved oxygen, temperature, conductivity, pH, turbidity and chlorophyll. I think that's right. Uh, we have seven ambient air quality sites throughout the region um, with obviously expansion going into that area um, going forward. Uh, Biomonitoring, we monitor 34 periphyton sites monthly, 105 macro, macro invertebrate sites annually. We have 16 electric fishing sites that we monitor during the summer season, December to March, and we do cyanobacteria monitoring across the region. Um, we have some specific sites, Falls Dam, uh, Lake Hayes and Lake Waihola that are monitored weekly or fortnightly but we also do reactive monitoring across the region during summer. So if somebody rings up and says that they've, they've spotted algae somewhere we will go and, and have a look at it and sample it. Biodiversity, uh, we're still establishing our biodiversity program in the monitoring team but at the moment we are heavily involved in uh, fish passage assessments. Uh, eDNA sampling, which we've done quite a lot of over the last 12 months, either using the sampling filters or the pods that are left in um, over, over a 24-hour period and then collected at the end of that. Um, we've had some really interesting results come out of, the, out of those and um, we've been supporting environmental implementation a little bit with the, any biosecurity risks that are arising um, or flags that are arising from that sampling. So we've been going back in and resampling if necessary. Uh, last summer we carried out habitat modelling in the Kakanui, um, but habitat modelling is quite a specific uh, discipline that requires a very experienced ecologist. Um, so we've just been kind of mucking in with that as, as best we can. Um, we carry out ecological thresholds, which is done annually. Um, fish surveys uh, and we're tracking threatened fish species and we have been doing a bit of trout removal um, but that has come to a bit of a standstill at the moment. Uh, low flow monitoring November to March again another summer edition. We currently have nine, 19 low flow sites uh, and we have a, a gauging protocol that we have to comply with over that period to ensure that those low flow sites are accurately rated for the irrigators um, and the general public's information. Uh, flood monitoring, uh, capturing targeted flows during high flow events at specific sites. Um, so we've done recently done some high flow gaugings um, following the rainfall that we had a couple of weeks ago down at particularly in this area, which was, was pretty interesting. Um, on the right, left hand side of your screen you can see a bit of a snapshot of where we have our discrete sampling sites and our continuous monitoring sites. Um, so you can see that we're fairly wide, widespread across the region. Uh, the team is spread from Dunedin to Palmerston through to Alex Cromwell, Queenstown and Wanaka. So we, we're getting some good coverage uh, in the monitoring. 
In addition to the field staff, we have our data systems team, and they are responsible for monitoring, the monitoring and maintenance of our telemetered data sets. Um, so we have 184 of those, with a total of around 350 parameters. Um, they are also responsible for ensuring that near real-time display of telemetered sites through the new web portal. Um, they maintain our telemetry network and they ensure that our data, which is going through to the environmental web portal at the end of the day for the public, is of good quality and has been through a, a rigid approval process. Uh, they also administer our water quality data through Aquarius web portal and samples um, and provide data for requests from internal and external stakeholders. Um, and just at the bottom of the screen there, you'll just see a bit of a snapshot of our new environmental data portal, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, um, and which we are continuing to extend so that we're getting more and more parameters on there. Um, and I'm going to hang, hand over to Nick for the exciting part of the presentation. Cool. Um, so as you can see, the team's got a lot of work to do, and um, yeah, they're very, very busy. So part of my role is to make sure that they've got the right tools in their toolbox to do it well and efficiently and safely. Um, so we're always looking at the market and our discipline at the best tools to use and what new technology is coming out. And generally that's driven by a need for improving safety, um, getting staff out of the water wherever possible, or staying out of the water and making uh, things safer in that respect. Uh, or improving efficiencies. Um, we've got a lot of work to do and limited resources, so if we can do things in a, a more efficient manner that basically increases the time that we've got without actually you know, getting more physical time. Um, one thing to look at as well is the whole life cost of the assets that we're buying and, and running our sites. So investing at the start often makes the longer term life cycle of a monitoring site, for example, um, cheaper mainly in terms of repeat visits for staff to fix issues if things go wrong. Um, so it's, that can be quite a valuable um, approach rather than just looking at the cheapest out, outset cost. Um, we're also looking to reduce our reliance on third party contractors um, through bringing tech in-house or using different tech to reduce that need. Um, and increase the efficiency, the flexibility in our work programs. And the other main driver of the new technology is data quality. We're getting a lot of pressure to always produce the best quality data in all situations. Um, it's quite a hard conversation to have sometimes to explain to people that we just can't get the best quality all the time, but we're doing our best. So the technology helps to improve that accuracy and also allow us to collect data in more challenging situations where we might not be able to otherwise. So I'm just going to go through a few of the things that we've invested in recently and um, just as a quick overview of what we're doing really. So one thing we've looked at is some of our sites are in very extreme environments. This one on the left here that's up on the top of the Dunstan Ranges at about 1600 metres elevation. Um, you can see there it's covered in rime ice after a storm and surrounded by snow. It's very cold. In the middle of summer it also gets very, very hot um, and very dry. So we've looked at um, our instrumentation is generally quite sensitive electronic instrumentation and telemetry equipment. So we try and protect that as much as we can. And these particular enclosures are made in Lower Hutt. Um, so they're New Zealand custom designed and made, which is quite cool. Um, so they automatically adjust for the environment. They've got a heater that comes on during the winter when it gets cold, and they have um, forced ventilation during the summer to keep things from getting too hot. So maintaining that even temperature helps with battery life, for example. Um, and this site, you can see the, the drive up there. It's a two-hour four-wheel drive trip each way. So if we had to go up there to change a battery out of cycle, it's um, a lot of time, it's a full day out of everyone's time, so we, we don't have the time to waste doing that. Generally it's a fly-in by helicopter, but you can't always do that. These, uh, you've probably seen these in the media, and 
and the like. These are um, kind of a godsend for our team. A lot of our work revolves around collecting flow data in the rivers and making sure that the information that you see coming out on the website is accurate. And to do that, we need to be out in the rivers collecting, physically measuring the, the flows in, in real life at different levels. And these boats, um, they carry our gauging equipment, the acoustic Doppler technology, and they basically removed a lot of the need for staff to get in the water and improve the efficiency just incredibly. Um, they're fully autonomous, basically stick it in the river, set a start point, end point, press go, and it just does its own thing across the river and collects really good data. Um, they are re removing a lot of our reliance on third-party jet boat operators, who are the, the one on the dart, for example. They're very inflexible in their timings and when we can do things. Um, I think it's like Fridays at 11 o'clock. It's not always the right flow at Friday at 11 o'clock. So, um, it, yeah, and it's expensive to run with those guys. So the picture bottom left, that's Jono at the dart. He can basically do a gauging in conditions that he, you'd never get in there, you'd never walk across there, um, from the shelter of his truck and one person. So that's pretty cool. And it was pouring down with rain that day. I was out there with him. So comfortable, safe, efficient, way better data than we could get with a jet boat. So it's really cool. And the, the picture on the top left, that's the Clutha at Tuapika Ferry. That was 1,460 cumics, I think. So a pretty big flow that was a couple of weeks ago. And the guys managed to do that from one bank, 160 metres across, fully remote control. Um, pretty amazing. And that's like a, a very expensive jet boat job to do that one. Uh, another thing that we're starting to get into is alternative satellite communication systems. Um, the one that we're using at the moment is through, provided through NIWA, and it's called Swarm. So it's the picture at the bottom in the middle there, that's the actual satellite that they're using. They're very tiny. They're, they're launching, I think there's 160 of them in orbit. But they basically provide us with a, a low orbit Wi-Fi network for our sites. Um, it's very cheap, very efficient way of getting comms out. And it's only come out in the last year or so. It, the main aim here is to improve the resilience of our sites in flood conditions, etc. So we get that critical data when we need it. Um, generally, we go for cell phone network as our primary, and then satellite as a backup, unless we can't get cell phone. Yeah, so they, they are helping quite a lot. The picture on the bottom right, that's Glenorchy Lagoon, um, a key flood warning site for the Glenorchy community. Um, that provided some pretty valuable data in the recent floods for them to know what was happening, as the stop banks were almost breached, I think. So the um, civil defence and emergency, man emergency management guys were very appreciative of that data in real time and knowing that it was always going to come in. And the last thing I'm just going to talk about is some of the new tech that we're looking at. We've just recently had some staff do training course on this. And this is using um, what they call image velocimetry, so using video footage to measure flows, basically. So you're not even touching the water. You're using video footage. It can be from a drone or a fixed camera. And it basically resolves the velocities on the water surface and you can interpolate how deep it is and come up with your flow. And it's, it's quite cool tech. There are a few fish hooks in it and it takes a very a skilled operator to understand how to process the data and get the right answer. But it's, um, yeah, it's going to be pretty cool. The little clip that paid on the top left, that's kind of the next step in this technology which is using three-dimensional imagery and it can resolve the water depth and the flows and basically in real time produce a flow as opposed to just water level. It's um, pretty amazing. So we've got a presentation from the suppliers on that next week to see how that's going to work. So it won't work everywhere but it's another tool for us to have in our toolbox. Um, 
Yeah, and that is pretty much it for me for today. That's awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, have some questions? Okay. Two questions. All right. Thank you. Um, the, you talked about the, the dependency on cell phone towers and the cell phone system for getting the data, and then talked about satellites. Is there any initiative New Zealand wide to have a New Zealand owned satellite system rather than relying on someone who some of us wouldn't think was necessarily going to be around for the long time for a good time? Um, not that I'm aware of, no. So the Swarm network is an uh, international network, yeah. and the other one that we use is called BGAN, it's on the Inmarsat um, network, so, so they're, they're both um, overseas <coughs> providers. So the Swarm isn't the Starlink, it's a... It's not one. Starlink, no, but it is owned by um, Elon Musk's crowd. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, um, it seems like a... An interesting way to be going and relying on what is exceedingly important information. Look, just looking at the um, this the slide you've got here, is there any way, does that sort of stuff show gravel movement um, at all? Um, this technology doesn't, but there may well be options for that, um, potentially. Because gravel movement is one that um, our community are really concerned about, and Sometimes having data that actually shows that it isn't as bad as they may think, or the capacity would be really helpful as yeah. you go through these events, because especially I'm thinking about Cooper. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure to be honest. Mm. There, there is um, improvements in lidar technology that will do bathymetric lidar, mm. so it'll actually shoot through the water and give you a, a bed surface as well as the water surface. But that obviously requires a plane to fly over and, yeah. and do it. Well, yeah, but, since you're going to be talking to them next week, I'd love to see if that technology is available sometime soon. Thanks. Also, we've got um, Brian, Andrew, and Tim. Cool. Uh, thank you. Thanks for all your work. Um, the environmental data portal was referred to earlier on. Are you involved with that? Yep, so our data team administers that. Cool. Yep. Because, I mean, this is amazing, but it's only as amazing you know, on the basis of how much it's actually used and understood. And so I've Googled it, I've got the whole load of the butt, E. coli and streams. Um, I mean, how's it going? You know, like, uh, have people given feedback on, uh, does it provide, I mean, I can't find the date for the information we don't have there, but, um, like, you put it in there, yep. have you had it independently verified? People, what's the feedback on it? Um, People are using it. We get a lot of feedback uh, regarding it, mostly people asking for more information um, and just seeking guidance around how they can utilise the data that's available on there themselves. So we really try to encourage the public to download the information themselves directly from the web portal if that's something that, that's available to them and they're wanting it um, to reduce kind of the pressure on our data team for doing those, um, yeah. those data requests. I mean, I would love a presentation on it I was just going to say, Brian, um, if you recall, Simon Wilson's given two workshops on the new environmental data portal in the last 18 months. So the whole basis of councils agreeing to invest in that was that mm -hmm. its purpose was to make our data much more available um, and user-friendly to our community. And obviously, um, even the environmental monitoring team have been heavily involved in that because it's, it's their work that's ending up in, within this, this portal. So... Um, Certainly, there's been some presentations. If we feel there's a need for more, we could we could arrange a session with Simon or Suze or um, the team just to just to sort of walk you through it. So, what's the status for this? How long has this been? Listening? Sorry, Captain. What's he doing? Um, so, you know, this is the one looking at here. How long has that been on that topic? Wallach. Wallach. Since February. February. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just a comment from myself. I think the environmental pause portal is pretty awesome. Um, the la <laughs> yeah. the la latest flood stuff, just the ability to be able to see on one place the rainfall numbers That's followed up by the flow figure numbers. And the other thing I might just add is the um, increased intensity of testing as well, of the numbers coming through on the various forms of communication. So it's like 10 minute, up, you know, 10 or 20 minute updates as opposed to early updates. So it's really a bit of a game changer for people managing 
managing water, you could say. Well, that's for floods. Yeah. Oh, just make sure your mics are on if you're talking. Um, thanks, Brian. We've got Andrew and then we've got um, Tom. Uh, Eve, you mentioned uh, in reference to the, the Four Lake Boys, um, perhaps problematic. Is that to do with um, choppy weather conditions or just weather conditions in general? Or are they not really fit for purpose? Or is there anything else you want to share with us that now that they've been up and running for a while? Uh, do you want to take that one? <laughs> um, it's probably a combination. Yeah. Not, I wouldn't say they're not fit for purpose. The weather, weather conditions, particularly in the last few weeks, have been at atrocious. Um, and you're talking about quite sensitive mechanical equipment working in a very severe environment. Um, they worked seamlessly for quite a while. And then that last storm, it was yeah, just a little bit too much. The guy that provides the tech is working on a more robust system. So he's hoping to upgrade that sometime in the near future. He was supposed to be coming down tomorrow to help fix, but the wind's going to get up again. So it's, um, so sort of more, it's obviously a, a solvable problem by the sound of it. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. not, not insurmountable. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And, and New Year's Eve, a boat took one of the systems out. So oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah oh, Easter time, that was. Easter? Oh, was it Easter? Yeah. 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 Easter. yeah. Easter. I knew it was a long weekend. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Oh, thank you, Tom. He turned it off to me. <laughs> no, that's good. Thanks. Um, we're really impressed by this autonomous river flow gauging platform. It, how much is it to buy one of these things? Uh, the platform's about $30,000. $30,000? Yeah, okay. Which is pretty good value, really, when you consider a jet boat gauging on the yeah. Clutha yeah. is about so you've 1300 got one. Is that correct? We've got three, three of them. How many? Three. Three, okay. Yeah, so there's one based in Central, one in Dunedin, and one in Palmerston. Yeah. Um, the other question I had was, you've got 107 water level sites, um, what sort of technology have you got and is there technology that needs replacing on those sites? What sort of maintenance programs have you got there? Uh, there are a variety of <laughs> technologies depending on the site. Um, generally it'll be uh, water level bubblers, which are like a dry pressure transducer or a, a wet pressure transducer. Or we also use a lot of radars in some of our lower level sites. Yeah. And some of the older sites with big stilling wells um, will have encoders in them, which are like a, a float and counterweight type system, which is the gold standard, but yeah. it's very expensive to put a stilling well in these days. But um, we are looking at it for some of our more critical sites. So you have a replacement program for those as well? Yeah, yeah. Generally, the data loggers and the instruments have kind of a 10 to 15 year lifespan, yeah. um, but we're constantly reviewing them. They often get damaged. So how many would you be replacing annually? Uh, probably maybe 10 to 20% of them on an annual basis. Yeah. Um, yeah. It kind of depends on what happens. We're always monitoring the data and yeah. looking for errors or drifting and et cetera. Thanks. Just one more question for one. Yeah, quick one, you. Um, Eve, you mentioned um, that you've put a halt to trout removal. Um, I was wondering if I might be able to help you. <laughs> so just, let me know, just let me know where you want them removed. Okay. Oh, we yeah. got <laughs> we've got Gary and then Kate. Um, thank you. Uh, Technology is awesome, and we should look to embrace it as much as possible. And so as we gather more, um, the what percentage is it actually accurate and functioning versus percentage of downtime, say, across our increasing level of technology? So, I mean, I'm assuming that because of the technology I'm involved in, lets us down when you least need it to, and uh, mm -hmm. we want it to. And so, not everything from the moment you start using it works perfectly for the entire time. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. Um, Particularly during floods, obviously that's the most extreme time that you can be trying to collect data, so the instrument's getting a fair hammering. Um, it's one of the reasons why at our critical sites we, we tend to run two parallel sites kind of almost next to each other. So if one gets taken out um, or comms goes over in one respect, we've got another one to provide the data and backup. Um, and that's where the swarm satellite stuff is quite good because it it generally sends on cell phone, but if cell phone network goes down, it will go through the satellite network. So, yeah, we try and provide some resilience in our sites. 
but in terms of data capture, we generally get what about 98, 99% yep. data capture rates. Yep. So, yeah, pretty good, really. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to um, Edward and then to Kate. Uh, kia ora, thank you. Uh, is there any monitoring or recording done along the coast, or is there a requirement um, plans to do that type of work? So actual coastal monitoring? Yes. Um, yeah. There's definitely plans to do it, but I think there is uh, some policy work that needs to be done uh, around that and then some science work to inform that before our monitoring would be fully endorsed. We do, Edward, we do do some um, monitoring in our uh, estuaries and that program has been stood up and I think we've shared that with committee uh, recently and that program of work is, it's about two years old so it's, um, it's developing and we have got a plan to, to start doing some monitoring in there. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks Edward. Um, Kate? Look, I'm a huge fan of the um, investment we've put into this and what the results you're getting out. Um, which is absolutely fabulous because you're really adding value to the community, not only in times of flood. Um, but I, I'm nice in January when I was watching the level of the river, just putting those flow gauges out and seeing that the flows changed quite markedly it had a huge um, economic benefit as well. Was, um, so, uh, really, really appreciate it and the effect that it's having. I suppose what I'm hearing, and this is where data is a great thing, and then people get frustrated, they want more. We can see and we've seen for years SOE sites that have said there's water quality issues, but it doesn't actually say the cause of those, of those issues. And I suppose, um, just thinking, what is it, is there a work stream that we can, or are looking at investing in to understand what the causes are or increasing the number so we can isolate it? Sometimes the responses are, Uh, Thankfully, we have the science this. manager yeah. in the house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excellent. Okay, yeah. uh, yeah, I can quickly help with that one. Um, so we we have absolutely, um, in the science team and within the EM team and others, we, we all recognise that that's, a, that's been a weakness of our SOE monitoring reports um, to date, but we're now moving, um, and you, know, you as council have chosen to invest in have chosen to invest in uh, land monitoring programs. Um, now those land monitoring programs will, will eventually help us to get to a space where we can start to talk to um, causal effects uh, for, for things like uh, nutrient runoff into, into waterways and all of that sort of thing. We should be able to also look at um, metres fenced um, and things that are changing in the environment and start to start to uh, talk to those things in terms of the benefit that they're having um, or the trends that we're seeing within those SOE reports. Um, so, so over time, we'd hope that they get a lot more applied um, just by simply recording a few additional parameters on top of the data. Data alone doesn't give, you, um, doesn't give you what we're looking for as a community in terms of being able to tell those stories, um, but, um, but those additional uh, bits of information will, will support um, that kind of thing in the future. So things like um, the eDNA tests might show whether it's the uh, faecal counts of human or animal, um, and issues like that. I mean, septic tanks is something I don't think any of us have got our hands on yet um, or understand. And so those concerns that some people expressed, we've, there was an expression of that last night, that's why it's on top of my mind. Um, we'll, we'll get a better picture of that in due course with us. Yeah, so those, those elements... Um we can also look at specific testing for and start to start to look at um, again the what the inputs might be and how they're resulting in terms of the trends we're seeing and all that sort of stuff. Right, great. Thank you. Can I just say we already do some faecal source tracking if we've got like a persistent E. coli problem and I think there's one in um, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, up near Palmerston where there's a in a yeah, there's a Wairakaroa where there's an E. coli issue and it's um, birds, avians. Yes, birds. Yeah. Yep. So we, we do faecal source track if we have a, a persistent problem and we want to understand the source. Thank you. I've, um, I think I've just got one quick question for you as well, uh, just around futuristic stuff, satellite tracks, so sat using satellites or you know stuff around measuring water quality 
parameters. So there's, you know, and like a lifetime Continuous quality. water yeah, quality. Yeah, so we already like do an element of continuous water quality monitoring. Um, at the moment, it's pretty limited to dissolved oxygen nitrate turbidity. Um, but uh, actually, we just had this discussion today. We've um, been approached by a company who are marketing a, a continuous E. coli monitoring system, um, which we are trying to figure out how we can ask them nicely if we could trial one over summer, um, because they're reasonably extensive at the moment. Um, yeah. But there's some interesting developments coming through in that technology. Um, stuff, yeah, just, I, I was just on the south stuff like River Shot doing satellite imagery and Android systems and that sort of thing. Just because um, it seems, yeah, quality rather than flows, I suppose. Yeah, in the flow space, there is a guy that's been using video footage taken from satellites to do flow gaugings, which is um, kind of next level kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, well, <coughs> thank you. We just got a question from um, Councillor Malcolm as well. Thanks, uh, Kevin. Oh, yeah, afternoon. Hey, uh, great presentation. Just, um, we heard from the, the Wanaka Catchment Group that they've got 48 sampling sites up the Matok and listen to why Wanaka, they're talking about 80 sites and some of those might be some of the 48 sites. So what work are we doing uh, within within the whole of Otago to ensure that we're not actually duplicating or, or making people aware of what we're doing to show that uh, there may not be a need for them to be doing it if we're doing it, and vice versa. Mm, good question. Um, thanks, Councillor Malcolm. I think um, what we heard those groups say is they rely on our network, but I think there is a piece of work we need to do to make sure that we are working together. Um, there's, um, there are some issues around data privacy, so some of that data is not public, um, but we're really keen to make sure um, that we are sharing that information, and if we can, reduce the load of um, what the team are doing, and that's really um, really useful if everyone's monitoring to the same standard. Um, we've got a, quite a rigorous QA process that goes over top of our data for the uh, SOE stuff, but, um, but I think there's a gap there in terms of making sure we are well connected up. And I'll just add to that, Kevin. Um, I think re just related to Kate's question, so we, we have our State of the Environment Network, which is of a particular quality and provides a particular role in terms of um, you know monitoring over time so there's we've, we've got the trend information available where there's some real value I think in the the community work that's going on is for that other layer that can start to point towards where the problem might be coming from that we're picking up in our in our broader state of the environment monitoring so where we want to do some of that work Tom's talking about we've got to ask the question as to whether some of that's already happening and that's one of the actions that came out of that lakes workshop you would have heard them talking about is starting to tie some of these monitoring networks together um, and use that information to um, tell us what the cause of some of the issues our state of the environment monitoring might be picking up. So there is still some work for us to do there, but we, we've heard and we know there's a huge amount of monitoring going on. Um, it's different to our own, but I think we can use it as part of that next step, which is more about the why are things happening. Absolutely. No, that's good. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, team. Well, that's awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, I have to apologise. I missed your presentation um, at the State of the Nation talks earlier on. I was away that day, but I was, yeah. Anyway, it's on video. I must have watched every video except that one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, oh, so, even Nicky, yeah, thank thank you very much, and it's and it's really good to you know to have you come in and. Keep us keep us well informed because there's a lot of you know there is a lot of monitoring going on and you probably don't appreciate it until you see it all on you know all set out on a piece of paper so and and and, if we, and you know we are in an organisation we need to be at the cutting edge as well so we need to be on top of you know developments and get the you know so that we can have really good information to make decisions so thank you very much thank awesome thank you so thank much thank you. And uh, we'll That's continue on awesome. with our meeting. So, um, <laughs> where am I up to? Oh, so um, we'll just carry on. The next, the next item on the agenda is confirmation of uh, the minutes of the last environmental policy and science committee. Someone would like to um, yes. confirm those minutes? Okay, thank you. Nobody? <laughs> Thanks, Kate. Will someone second? Thanks, Alan. 
All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, any discussion around those minutes? If not, we'll carry on to the. Sorry, Andrew. Yes, yes, you're correct, um, Councillor Noon. We were intending to bring the issues and options paper, but because of the timing of the workshop, that's going to come uh, December now. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Andrew. Awesome. Another question. So, um, came, we come to the, 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 main, um, the main part of the um, proceedings today. Um, unfortunately, Scott's not here with us to present his. Um, paper on bats and I must say um, um, before we get started Scott's one of my favourites um, you can walk past um, if, if you can walk past Scott's desk without saying anything you, you might get out of the building but if you actually ask him how things are going he is so passionate that man he's so so awesome so I made um, a, I made a point of reading the paper a couple of times just in case there's something I'd missed so um, but apparently um, Scott's um, got his understudy to come along to present his paper to us today. <laughs> um, so um, we'll leave it in your capable hands. Um, Tom. Uh, yeah, thanks for the welcome. Um, <laughs> the, yes, Scott couldn't be here today. He's taking some annual leave and I believe he's um, you know, talking to his passion. I believe he's undertaking um, some peripheral conservation work. Um, he's this, the man lives and breathes uh, uh, biodiversity in Otago. Um, but uh, to, I'll just some brief opening notes. Um, this is our second threat classification uh, report, and the purpose of these is uh, providing a regional picture of uh, of the conservation status of um, and some other information um, of uh, different taxa within the region to support uh, you know people when they're uh, putting together development proposals or. Um, even um, some of the groups uh, that we saw today that were presenting might draw on these for um, inspiration in terms of where their conservation work might occur or um, uh, any number of different things. Um, we draw on experts from across uh, across the region and nationally uh, to pull these together. Um, and um, Scott always ends up being the main author, but uh, uses takes advice from um, experts in the specific species that he's working on, the specific uh, area that he's working on. Um, uh, this, this report will be followed up by two more, uh, probably early in the new year, uh, for indigenous vascular plants and for birds. Um, those two will be quite a lot more substantial, as there's a great deal more species, um, but for bats it's pretty short and sweet. Um, I can't profess to be able to provide a whole lot of um, detailed expertise on this, um, but um, certainly give any questions you've got a go um, or take them on notice uh, and get Scott to come back to you later on. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Tom. Um, we'll just take questions to Tom. Um, yeah, just in terms of our responsibility for endangered species, um, what, what is the policy here? Because I know that DOC has got a responsibility as well. So, what sort of is there a crossover, or, or are we doing things differently than DOC, or what's happening? Yeah, so through our regional plans and other um, documents, we do have a, a statutory responsibility to provide for threatened species and, and for the conservation of um, uh, of all um, native species. Um, so these these helped these sorts of documents help to inform that and just provide that regional picture. Um, we work closely with, so that that's not necessarily a conservation activity, but a regulatory activity in that space. Um, uh, but there are some conservation efforts that uh, run across both DOC and um, and Otago Regional Council's wheelhouse from time to time, and you end up seeing a little bit of collaboration there. Um, some some good examples are. Uh, work on um, some native fish species and other bits and pieces over the last couple of years. So the difference between a threatened species and an endangered species, is that defined? Uh, and I don't think endangered is a term that's used in the New Zealand technical classification. Threatened um, threatened is the standard, um, but it's but they're interchangeable for the purpose of this type of meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Um, Elliot? 
Yeah, um, my wife was a bit choppy, so uh, shout out if you guys can't hear me properly. Um, but I just wanted to ask if, um, uh, from what I understand, like talking to researchers um, in this field around bats, there seem to be new populations uh, popping up all the time. And I'm wondering if that's um, something we're expecting around Otago. Uh, yeah, that's correct, and I think that's reflected in the report too, um, uh, and largely put down to the uh, efforts of um, uh, you know pest control efforts from different various departments or voluntary agencies. Um, uh, I think what you also see is where uh, where a species or a taxa isn't um, actively monitored. Uh, you know, assertively, um, you they get missed, um, and you get kind of discov discoveries of small populations in different places and bats being highly mobile and all of that sort of thing can, can pop up in, in different areas as things change around them. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. You good there, Elliot? Yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah, we'll move on. Um, Brian? So oh, I'm not sure you'll come back. Yeah, Brian, we'll go to you. Um, where to uh, from here for these endangered bats? And who's responsible for what? Uh, there's, a couple, there's a couple of um, uh, monitoring suggestions within the report itself, um, and some of those some of those suggestions may fall with Otago Regional Council, um, as we understand our responsibilities under the uh, National Policy Statement Indigenous Biodiversity. Um, uh, they may also fall with district councils um, and, or, and or with DOC. Um, uh, there's probably quite a lot to do. Um, there's quite a lot of um, interest forming in terms of community groups um, uh, around native land mammals and, and all of that sort of conservation activities as well and how they can um, look at the, you know, where there's trapping efforts occurring, how they can look at um, bats as an indicator of um, uh, success. Um, uh, the, there's a few other things identified in there as well, but I guess the, the key one is that this report then uh, forms a basis for future land and water plan development, for future pest strategy um, uh, and pest uh, management plan development type um, activities. Um, they'll, they'll, this document provides a basis for uh, other teams within the council to start um, pulling together those documents and, and um, undertaking those activities. For pests, for pests and for land and for regional um, land and water plan type work. Can't hear the question. Could you push this button? Be good. Yeah. So we have some responsibility for monitoring, um, and the possibility of moving into pest management has been raised. Is there more to it than that, in, in terms of, or is that it, and to enable a species to thrive? Uh, Looking at the assessment um, here, the key threats that are identified are pests. Okay. Um, uh, there's a couple of others, other peripheral ones, climate change and, and other bits and pieces, but the number one actor okay. is pests. Thank you. Okay. Great report, thank you. Um, I've asked this before in a sort of different way. We do this data, we know what we know. Um, and we don't go and put it on a bookshelf, I'm sure. But the opportunities, there are a lot of land owning holders with um, remnant bush or environments that may suit this that just don't know what to look for. And as we've got biodiversity credits being at something that people are looking at on land, um, I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity that, and, and great, great PR on the press release that's gone out today, by the way, and great to see that Radio New Zealand has picked up very quickly. Um, 
but just understanding how do we get the information out and to other people who aren't part of Southern, um, what, yeah, the Southern Group, Pools Group, I can't remember what it is, yeah, or, or HALO, is how do you get the other people to know that this information is available? Or in the, in a, do we send it out through OCC or any of those groups or catchment groups that say, you know, I, because that's where we may find um, populations that we don't know about now. Yeah, totally. Um, so two things to that. One is um, we do try and share these reports as widely as possible. Um, Recognise that um, in the format that they're in, they're quite technical and quite dense. Um, uh, so we've we are also developing um, summary documents that are a bit simpler um, and targeting targeting a different audience. Um, so that's that's occurring, and those will be shared widely. Um, and, and I think we'll target the types of audiences that you mean. Um, the, and the other part is, uh, I think once we've got a, a couple more of these done, we're going to do a bit of a roadshow um, and run around and try and actively share the info such that you know people know that we're actually doing this work and that um, these documents exist. Uh, okay. Cool. Do you have any other questions? Tom? Just a clarification. Um, the, the, the species are either threatened or at risk, according to DOC. Um, and it's the threatened species that seem to be getting the funding through DOC. Um, and, and the at risk, even declining species, don't seem to be getting a lot of funding either. So, I mean, I've, my, my question was based around my involvement with the Yellow Penguin Trust um, and the fact that they've lost all funding from DOC. So, that was. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's correct. Typically, the uh, so threatened threatened is a higher classification than um, than at risk. Um, and yeah, typically we do see more funding poured into species that are closer to extinction or um, that type of thing. Um, and yeah, it was obviously the one remaining bat species in in Otago was identified as um, regionally threatened. Um, although I'm not sure of the national status, I probably I'd need to check back through the report. I was thinking about that as you were asking. Any, any further questions? I've got a couple um, in the discussion point 13. Um, I just, point 13 basically says an expert panel and an, an ecologist from Otago Regional Council, I probably think it should probably say an expert panel including a, yep. an uh, ecolog uh, ecologist from Otago Regional Council. Yes, it should. Yeah, I think that would just be um, quite good. And the other thing I had down, it's actually in the second uh, attached paper as well. Um, uh, the, I was a couple of things. One, the one I was going to ask is about the, because it's got three categories, the regionally threatened and then the, you know, the not so much data type one. There's three different categories in here and I've lost it now. Dash. It's in the, it's in the appending report, the, in that report that's been written. Because this paper is all about creating a classification system as a, yeah, there it goes, 16. So you've got regionally extinct, regionally critical and regionally data deficient. Yep. So, um, so my, probably my question is, regionally extinct when you haven't seen any for quite a while, um, but the uh, regionally data deficient, so we've, there's, this is the short tail ones, they've said that they're there, but we don't really have enough data to enable to categorise them. Yep. So do we, does, does that mean they go onto a watch list that we continue? Yeah, so at the moment we don't do any active monitoring ourselves. We rely on data from other agencies um, and academics that are undertaking studies in this space. Um, so I so I use that as a caveat. Um, uh, there's not many folks actively targeting monitoring bats. Um, uh, so for that particular species and it's uh, the status of regionally data deficient, that was put there because there was observations just 2k over the border in Southland um, uh, and so up the Egl Eglinton Valley, just up from Tiana. Um and it could be expected that there's bat communities quite close by um, within the Dart or the Greenstone. Um, uh, however, no one's undertaking monitoring that we're aware of there at the moment um, and so that regionally data deficient status kind of speaks to that. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Uh, and also a question for yourself, Tom. Um, 
says in the in the discussion on that same paper towards the end that there's um, um, long tail bats have also been caught in the highly fragmented and mon modified landscapes of Tapanui and Lethan just outside the Otago border. I was just wondering if they'd have um, different tax or a different uh, DNA to the other bats that live everywhere else. <laughs> Oh, you've you've uh, just got outside of what I can uh, even get close to, I think, Lloyd. I think they're probably quite special, those ones. Yeah, yeah, indeed. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think they're maroon in colour. Sorry, I'm maroon in colour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, have we got, do we have any other questions? Yeah, oh, thanks, Gary. Just, just on that, because um, the, you know, this could lead to a financial implication for Otago. At that point that you've just raised around, uh, Tago is not an island, with nothing around it, it has other regions around it. So, would part of that effort then be looking at, well, have we got this species potentially just over the border? So, before we would look for further investment in Otago. Mm. Yeah, I, there's a national picture. Every time we do one of these reports, there's a there's a regional picture that we're portraying here, but there's also a national picture to take into account. And I think um, as we go through uh, developing all of these reports and go through a process of understanding and planning for any responsibilities that fall with us under the MPSIB, um, we'll have to go through a process of working out, you know, what is required, um, uh, what does. Uh, the Otago Regional Council um, wants to undertake uh, as a task and then working out things like you know, if we are in that space then what are our indicator species that we're uh, really looking for because there are um, hundreds of uh, of species uh, across all taxa that fall within that, uh, that uh, threat list um, and so yeah, it'd be a matter of working out which ones to target, how to target them efficiently, and what goals we were uh, looking to achieve in terms of monitoring or conservation restoration work. Cool, thank you. There's a, really, there's a hugely important bit there just around connecting with the other agencies involved Don't as mean. well, whether that be neighbouring regional councils or Department of Conservation or private academic studies, um, just, just to make sure that you know there's, there's not enough money to do everything, so it's got to be a coordinated programme um, other, otherwise we're, we're just going to be tripping over each other so that's that's starting now and some early conversations in the long term plan with some of those agencies around work programs and crossover and opportunities to collaborate but we're not going to solve it all in the next six months um, it's just something we've got to be conscious of as money gets tighter and, and you know it's a normal thing as, as there's more work done like this it creates more work um, so we've just got to be very smart in how we respond to it and not just not just respond to everything immediately, um, be, be deliberate in how we do it and take our time to plan it well. Yep, because exactly, because the paper is highlighting financial implications at later stages, and of course, some issues as well. But thank you. That's awesome. Do we have any other questions? Oh, if not, I'd just like to, um, I'd just like you to pass on the, the committee's um, appreciation to uh, Scott when he's back in the office and um, and tell him it's um, really good to get um, some media prior to the event, which is really good and positive. He's sort of broken a bit of new ground there for us, which is excellent. I'd also just like to mention, that, you know, from the last um, environmental science and policy meeting as well, where we had, well, the one about Luther, probably the one before that. So we're getting all these baseline papers coming through that are setting our baselines for that we can build on and move forward, and so that we can actually make decisions that have got some information in behind them. And I also note that this paper has been written in conjunction with, I think, two other areas that are in the process of um, creating the, the categorisation for threatened species. And, and so at the end of the day, I just think well done that we're actually showing that we are leading, we are actually getting a science team that's not even a science team that's functional. We're getting a science team that's starting to become um, leading in some of these areas. We've got people like Scott that are actually leading it at a national level, which is really awesome to see, and we can all be pretty proud of the proud of it. And we look forward to um, continuing to build that database of knowledge, that, so that we can make informed decisions into the future. So, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll make sure I share that. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, before we do too much more, um, where we're actually here, we've got a job to do, we're here, so just um, 
Can we get somebody like to note the report? Um, we'll throw this to you there to note the report and note the regional threat assessment of other taxonomic groups will continue as part of the biodiversity work program. So we've got Alexa and uh, Alan. Um, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Carried. And thank you very much. That brings us to the end of our agenda for today. Have you got any housekeeping meetings? Have you got any housekeeping meetings? Okay, so that's all good. Um, we'll um, close the meeting off ahead of our um, evening functions and uh, good look around tomorrow. So I'll just close them. I'll just close the meeting with uh, Karakia. Uh, kia tau te rangi Māori e ki runga ina iwi o te ao. Let peace reign on all peoples of the world. Amen. Thank you.